Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for joining the Fresh Outlook Foundation's second session of our first Heads Up Community Mental Health Summit. And our topic today is exploring traditional and emerging trends for prevention and care. I'm Joe DeVries, founder of the, of the Fresh Outlook Foundation. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. And if you're with us again, welcome back. First, I'd like to thank our amazing sponsors and supporting granting organizations. It goes without saying that without your help, we wouldn't all be here. Uh, please watch as we acknowledge them during the breaks. I'd also like to acknowledge that this program originates on the unceded territory of the Silix people in the Okanagan region of British Columbia, Canada. And now um, a huge thank you to Janine Rayburn for joining us. This session is dedicated to her and her family. Good morning, Janine. Good morning. I, I just so appreciate you being here and sharing your story. I know that it's not easy. I asked Janine to speak to both your heads and your hearts with a personal account of what's called society's invisible mental health challenges, those affecting our children. But first, let's look at the numbers. Did you know that 70% of mental illnesses start in childhood? or that in the last decade, child mental health emergency room visits have increased by almost 70% as well. And did you know that suicide is among the top three causes of preventable deaths in children and adolescents, or that youth suicide in Canada is the third highest among industrialized country? Yes, those statistics matter, but they don't motivate and mobilize us to change the system like the stories behind the statistics do. Stories like Janine's that started in April 2017 when her soon-to-be nine-year-old son, Lyndon, attempted suicide for the first time. Janine, tell us about Lyndon at that time. Did you notice anything out of the ordinary? Well, he had been uh, bullied since kindergarten and school, so we started to see a bit of a decline um, in his behavior and school refusal. Um, so we did see those signs, and uh, the year previous, we did do the normal channels of going through um, the resources that we have, and they basically just said, statistically, he's not uh, of the age group that would take their own life and it's usually when they're a teenager and then a year later um, he he tried. So can you tell us about that day April 27th 2017? Yeah so we were getting to take him to school um, and it was just after spring break um, and he we were walking down to the parkade where we live and instead of walking down he ran uh, to the road on Glenmore Road and tried to get hit by a, a car. Uh, luckily, I was able to take him off the road in time, but that landed us our first visit at KGH. So after that first attempt, did you get the help you needed for Lyndon? Uh, no, not, not immediately. Um, we ended up in pediatrics for a few days. Uh, they basically keep you there until he's more regulated. Um, and then our discharge uh, instructions from the social worker were go to the dollar store, buy sensory tools, and try to prevent him um, from getting to that red zone of self-regulation, they call it, and um, call 911 if it happens again. So that was the first of other attempts. Can you tell us what you've learned about Lyndon's condition as a result? Yeah, so Lyndon has um, general generalized anxiety disorder. He has depression. He also has learning disabilities. Um, and then he actually was just recently in hospital last month um, for three weeks. And he came out of there with another diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. How has Lyndon's illness affected you given that you're on call 24 seven? 
uh, we're all exhausted. I mean, um, I've actually had to leave work um, in 2017 to be with him. And then I'm actually off again now um, for my own mental health and trying to get him the help that he needs requires a lot of care and attention and phone calls and advocacy. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's taken a big toll on all of us. So are you personally getting the help you need? Privately. Um, we pay for private um, uh, counseling for him, myself, my daughter, um, and that's all we can do uh, right now. And then just reach out and continue. We're not getting the school support that's needed. Um, so that's our next biggest challenge. So this is a photo of Lyndon with his sister, Emma. How has Lyndon's illness affected her? Oh, <laughs> um, so she was five when he first tried, um, and she thinks she can save him. Um, she would block the door. She was maybe 30 pounds at that time, and she would try to block him from um, trying to take his own life. Um, and she's had to grow up a lot faster than those children. Which leads me to my next question. Although Lyndon is still with us, it seems that you and your family are grieving. Does that sound right? Yeah, I mean, Lyndon hasn't had much of a, well, he hasn't had the normal, quote, childhood. Um, he's been in and out of hospital since 2017. Um, he can't go to, he has school refusal. He can't go to school like most kids. Um, and so I feel like we're grieving for that. Um, I've changed. I'm, I'm hardened. I'm put walls up. I'm not the same person I was. And, um, you know, it's just, we're longing for just to have some peace and it hasn't necessarily, it's come in spurts, but it's, it hasn't been, um, peaceful for a while. I'd like to share another thing about you, Janine, that is so admirable. And from what I'm learning, not uncommon for people who experience mental health either directly or indirectly. With all that's going on in your life, you still established a nonprofit organization. Yeah. Tell us about that. So with Lyndon's visits, he's 12 now, so he turned 12 last April. Um, but before that, uh, we really found a gap in resources um, for children 12 and under. And there's really not much for them for prevention. Um, and I feel like that's the age where you can really prevent a lot of the stuff that happens later on in their life. So we created the Yellow Light Project and we took the advice from that social worker with our first visit and we did go to the dollar store and we bought sensory items and we created an anxiety prevention kit. And it did help Lyndon. It's, it's not a solution but it's definitely something that can help and and validate at, at the very least of what they're going through um so we did that and uh, we thought other kids could maybe benefit from that so we started the yellow light project and we're trying to really reach the children when they're in the yellow zone we call it or um before they hit that red zone i mean each kid has their own zones but the self-regulations um and we feel like that's the preventative care that our kiddos need and so we're really trying to wrap our heads and our our tools together to help kids uh, to prevent this from continuing to happen. Uh, it's a beast. It's it's a huge issue. It's complex. It's um, there's so many different areas that need support in our government systems that need to be changed. Right now, we're focused on the school system. Uh, tell us a little more about that. So this is a. Um, yeah, so it's so Lyndon has a designation. It's called an H designation, and what that gives him is just over nine thousand dollars of funding in the school for to support him. However, there's no in classroom support. It actually goes to mostly administrative work. Um, so Lyndon's anxiety starts in the classroom. So he also has learning disabilities, and if that's not being met, he will be triggered. So that's where the prevention comes in. If we're, and that's what I'm fighting for, is if he can get the support in classroom, we might be able, maybe not all the time, but cut down the amounts of time that he's triggered. And 
you know, as we share our story, there is countless stories out there. Um, I just heard from a mom last night uh, from Nanaimo and her eight year old has um, uh, OCD and generalized anxiety disorder. Because of the pandemic, the school actually of 350 kids cut down the school counselor hours. So they're down to one school counselor one day a week. So it's just another example that this is not just a BC problem, this is a countrywide problem. And um, if anything, they should be increasing school counseling mm -hmm. during a pandemic. You don't yes. decrease it. Yeah. So that's just another example. I mean, we have numerous times um, being our doors being shut with the schools and they're not getting the proper funding, especially children with a lot of complex challenges that don't check off all the boxes, but they need the support and they're not getting it. When I first heard your story, Janine, I was I was totally blown away because first of all, I didn't know that that this kind of of uh, mental illness in children was a thing. But I also didn't realize that there was nothing or very little available to children under 12 in the mental health care system. Yeah. What, what do you think should be done about that? Oh man, um, there's a lot of the resources and um, programs out there don't start until they're at least 12. That needs to change or come up with a different program for these younger kids. Um, that it doesn't make sense to me that we're not addressing it um, at a younger age when we're seeing the school refusal start in kindergarten. Um, a lot of these kids have been bullied, they have PTSD, and that's not being addressed. It's not being addressed until they're a teenager or an, an adult. So how can we, you know, we're going to prevent homelessness and addiction and all of those things if we get it at a younger age. I really feel strongly about that. So we do need, um, you know, the, the mental health for kids. They, they need to be, have those resources available. And I read a, a great quote from a social worker and it was basically that the families will only be, so the resources will only be available to the families when they're in crisis. There is no prevention. Yeah. That needs to change. And yes. um, you're seeing it across the board with many professionals. I don't think you'd get a lot of people saying that's not happening. So if you could say one thing to our viewers about what you've learned about childhood mental health and how they can help, what would that be? So to continue to share your story, um, as scary and as um, criticized you might become, it's worth it. Um, the other families that are going through the same thing, you'll find that there's a lot out there. You're not alone. We say that, but you truly aren't alone. Um, and it's okay not to be okay. And that's another saying, but really truly mean it. We need to validate our kids and what they're going through. It's so hard as a parent because you never want to enable them, but we do need to validate what they're feeling and uh, get them that support that's needed. So, and I thought a year and a half ago, maybe when we were going back and through this, that I just, I loved my son. I love my son so much. And I would say it, I could say it a thousand times a day and it wasn't getting through until just most recently, this last go around, I found out that it has been enough and I am getting through to him. So even if you feel like you're not, you are. And so let just know that all your fighting, all your advocacy, all the love you're giving, it is, it, they are absorbing it, even though if it feels like they're not. Janine, you are an incredibly strong and resilient young woman. I thank you for being so open, for being so articulate, and I wish you and your family all the best moving forward. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Thank you, Joanne. So this second session of the Heads Up Summit explores, as I said before, traditional and emerging models of prevention and care. 
So my rationale for this was to start yesterday at 50,000 feet to talk about mental health care systems overall, then zoom down for a closer look at how emerging science and treatment models can help individuals, families, and workplaces move toward better mental health. And then this afternoon, we'll take what we've learned to enrich discussions about finding integrated solutions for substance use and homelessness, which are significant challenges in many communities. My expert co-facilitator this morning is Dr. Javid Sakara, a clinical psychiatrist, associate professor at Western University School of Medicine and Dentistry, and past president of the Ontario Psychiatric Association. Welcome, Javid, and thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me and thank you to Janine for sharing your story, even as a, a professional who works in the system. Completely agree with you. It's designed upside down and backwards. And I've heard the same from so many that they have to be in their worst possible state to get help. Uh, and I just think that's unacceptable. Uh. In addition to the great work I already mentioned that you're doing, you also conduct research focused on stigma reduction. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so, you know, very early in my career, I recognized that the ways in which uh, people with mental illness and addiction are treated by the health system are completely discriminatory and prejudicial. But I also recognize that a lot of uh, that stigma is baked into the system and people uh, participate in it, in it without even being aware. So my research really focused on how we can help people recognize that stigma exists within all of us, that sometimes we exhibit it without being consciously aware and despite our best intentions. And so we've researched stigma in healthcare environments and also researched ways to tackle stigma through education and structural change. So just so you know, uh, we'll be diving deeper into the topic of stigma, the beginning of, of this afternoon session with uh, Dr. Stephanie Knack from the Mental Health Commission of Canada. And just so you know, Javid has also kindly agreed to be interviewed for a future Heads Up Community Mental Health podcast episode about youth self-harm, which is a major focus in his clinical practice. So Javid, before we delve into various models of care with our speakers, can you help us understand what or who is driving the increasingly rapid evolution of mental health research, diagnosis and care? So I think that we're seeing very clearly and consistently across the country in the course of the past five to 10 years, a significant increase and people asking for help and presenting, uh, seeking services for support. Uh, I would say it's complex. There's no one thing that can explain it, but there's a lot of different forces that have a role to play. One is that, that people are building up the courage to, to ask for help. There are signs that stigma is improving uh, in our culture, yet unfortunately the system hasn't really caught up. There's been decade after decade of report calling for substantive and transformative system change but we know that if you know someone has two kids one has physical illness and one has mental illness the child with physical illness gets high quality care and oftentimes the child with mental illness uh, is put on a wait list for an unacceptable period of time we also know that it's a very different time for young people they are dealing with many adult problems without really having developed adult brains and, and adult coping skills. Uh, they have to access an inordinate amount of information. Um, kids these, that, that we know can pause what they're watching to go to the bathroom. So in terms of being able to reconcile um, some of the challenges of the world that we're living in, we have to think of the societal forces that have shaped that. What we also know is mental health is underfunded. It's underfunded structurally. Mental health research is underfunded as well. And in particular, children's mental health is even more underfunded, which uh, Janine's case exemplifies. All right. Well, thanks, Javid. And we'll talk soon after our first presenter's uh, presentation. 
So Janine's story and Javid's insight set the stage perfectly for this session's keynote by Vanessa Lapointe called Childhood Mental Health, the Unquestionable Link to Community Resilience. And that was really important to me because at the Fresh Outlook Foundation, we talk a lot about community sustainability. So when we, we look at, at, yes, the impact of mental mental health on, on individuals and families and workplaces, we also like to extend that discussion to communities. And given that children are the future of our communities, I'm, I'm really excited to hear what Vanessa has to say about that. Vanessa is a registered psychologist who's also a renowned educator, consultant, speaker, and best-selling author of two books, Discipline Without Damage, and Parenting Right From the Start. Regularly invited as a media guest, Vanessa is also a Huffington Post parent blogger and a consultant to research projects and various organizations promoting emotional health and development. She is especially passionate about walking alongside parents teachers, care providers, and other big people to really see the world through children's eyes. By doing that, she believes we are beautifully positioned to help them grow up in the best way possible. Welcome, Vanessa. So, so honored and thrilled to have you here. Thank you, and I am honored and thrilled to be here. This is um, a, a topic that's very close to my heart, both personally and professionally. And so to be able to collectively come together to uh, shine a light on why it is so important that we are able to make sense of the world of mental health uh, for our children and also for the big people who are loving on them and to um, take the lens even further back and understand the role of community in coming alongside parents and kids so that kids get the best possible shot. Now, what we know for sure uh, is that uh, children do not live in a vacuum. And so we have to understand the kind of uh, trickle down effect of the world around them and figure out how to have impact at every single level of that world. When I um, talk about these kinds of things, I uh, really kind of uh, want to be informed by both science and heart. What I have learned over the years, I've been supporting kids and their families now for about 20 years, is that if I come at it just through science, then I've missed the boat. I need to combine the best of science with the heart of what it is to be human in order to be able to connect and um, uh, champion families champion parents and their children uh, to move along life's journey in a way that's going to work for them. And as I was preparing to uh, speak with you all this morning, I uh, was sitting and reflecting on the state of the world all around us right now and uh, wanted to begin by really um, highlighting how important it is for all of us to know right now that we are made to do hard things. It is part of our very nature in terms of uh, digging deep and surviving. And so when the going gets tough, it is an opportunity for us to rest into the knowledge that we are uh, born to do hard things. We've got the capacity to be adaptive. We have the capacity to be resilient. All of our children have that within them. So it is upon us as the grown-ups, as the big people, I like to call them, out in community to make sure that we are showing up, that we have toes to the line, and we really have rallied uh, for our children collectively to get um, what it is that they need so that they get to become who it is that they are intended to become. So never forget, we are born to do hard things. And another overarching message that I wanna begin with is that it really does come down to connection. Connection is everything at the level of community all the way down into the home and at the level of the relationship between the child and their special big people who are part of their inner circle. We know now from, I mean, really decades of research 
uh, that as a human species, we are a social species. We are meant to be in relationship with one another. When we look at the work of trauma experts, um, they really uh, tell us that we have to make sure our children grow up marinated in connection and that parents are also being marinated in connection within the proverbial village so that they aren't feeling so on their own in this monumental task of raising a human being, especially in our modern day world, which has become very overwhelming, very busy, very disjointed, and problematically within all of that, we've lost access to a lot of that historical, naturally existing um, uh, sources of connection. And so as big overarching uh, pieces where we dive into uh, talking about this topic, really remember, we have got this in us. We do. Every single child has it within them to be adaptive and resilient. And we have to awaken that by providing support from the outside that connects with the heart of the child. And we do that by making sure we are connection focused in all things at the level of community trickling on down into the level of the home. Now, many years ago, when I was a doctoral student, I uh, focused my dissertation research on the impact of community on the um, developmental outcomes of young children. And I looked at actually 497 different neighborhoods across the province of British Columbia. And one of the things that we know through uh, my work and uh, the work of other um, developmentalists and epidemiologists is that community has a big role to play in the healthy, happy uh, development of young children. And as I was listening to Janine speak first thing this morning, um, she has highlighted so eloquently the need to get in in the early years and the need to be coming at this from different layers within community in order to make sure that kids and parents uh, uh, get to sort of be their best. And when we can lay that kind of uh, foundation, we do end up coming at all things related to mental health from a prevention framework rather than a reactive treatment kind of framework. And, and while we need all of those pieces in play, without question, um, prevention becomes a very key area of focus and something to be targeting when we're looking at making sure uh, we're doing right by our children. Of course, what makes that incredibly challenging is that when you look at the very many different influences in terms of um, the systems uh, that are all around children as they are growing up, that's a lot of different pieces to be coordinating. And so we need to be able to have a model or a way of thinking through all of that that allows us to understand theoretically and practically how to bring those pieces together. And thankfully, um, there are a variety of models that exist to that end, but one of them that I want to um, highlight as incredibly helpful um, and important in making sense of this for kids um, is the ecological framework of understanding human development put forward by Yuri Bromfenbrenner. And what Brown from Brenner said is, when we're looking at this kind of um, information and this sort of a topic, we have to understand that children do not grow up in isolation. Children grow up, and he likens it to the matryoshka or the Russian doll, uh, that there's the smaller doll inside the smaller doll inside the smaller doll, that this is the layers of the systems. And right at the very heart of that, we have the child. But the child isn't uh, breathing air unaffected by the world around. The child is literally being marinated in the air of the system. And what we know from um, other people like Dr. Daniel Siegel, who's a prominent psychiatrist from the US, uh, is that the environment around the child shapes the mind. And so we need to make sure that that environment is being um, fiercely created in a manner that lines up with the science of child development. For when the environment lines up with the science of child development, then children do not have to fight against what it is that is happening around them. They do not have to overcome what it is that is happening around them. They get to just rest 
rest into their own developmental journey. And the challenge is that for a lot of children who have you know, mental health issues uh, presenting and or um, have kind of uh, red flags early on in life that they are vulnerable to developing mental health kinds of issues, a lot of those children and their families run into so many speed bumps and roadblocks and um, diversions along the way uh, that it actually uh, creates what I call a layer two problem. So layer one is how the child was presenting to begin with, and layer two becomes the fallout uh, that is created within the child because the world around has not lined up in terms of what it is that the child, that their parent, that their family, that their school, that their community needed. And so we really do have to look at all levels of the system and that we have to come at that from a preventative standpoint in order to really make the world of kids go around. Uh, in a manner that resonates um, with what we know they need from the science of child development. To that end, I want to just uh, talk with you about a few things to be keeping in mind. I think these things are particularly relevant given that we are currently living through a global pandemic. And uh, in the experience of that global pandemic, um, we have seen two kinds of trends emerging for uh, children, particularly kids who are struggling with mood-based um, disorders or challenges, things like depression and anxiety. And what we've seen is that there's been a partitioning of those uh, children into two different groups. One group of children is actually doing quite well in the midst of all of this, um, particularly during the times when we were in lockdown um, and had sort of more restrictions upon us. And that was because we had turned down the volume on their very loud, overwhelming world, and all of that had come to a stop. So these kids got an opportunity to breathe and to rest. Those children that have done well are typically surrounded uh, by families who are also doing well. And families who do well are typically nested within communities of support. And so we've seen how that can uh, be um, actually a positive for a lot of children. And we can take some learning from that going forward post-pandemic. Unfortunately, there is a second group of children that we need to be talking about. And for this group of children, the experience of the pandemic has actually amplified their pre-existing challenges. And so where they were anxious before, they are debilitated by anxiety now. Where they felt um, unsettled and often dysregulated before, um, they are full of suicidal ideation and other such things now. And so there has been uh, a group of children for whom the pandemic has been incredibly deleterious and we're going to need to be very aware that the next wave of COVID-19 is going to be a mental health wave and we will see that coming out in our children. And so it is upon us um, as communities and as systems to begin to ready ourselves for um, responding to what that uh, crisis is going to um, look like. So when we are in crisis, what we need to know is that there is um, certain things that are gonna happen within the mind and in the brain. And as I talk you through these things, I want you to think about it at all levels um, of the system. So I want you to think about this, even at the level of community, how it might present, um, for parents, how it might present, and of course, in our children, how it might present. When we are in crisis, we know that the brain comes alive with something called the negativity bias, which means that we will be Velcro to the negative and Teflon to the positive. And so it's really hard for us to be able to see that the horizon sparkles with hope. We get lost in the darkness of the storm that is all around us, and this is a survival tactic. We don't intentionally do this, of course. We are wired to survive, and so this is a way that our brain tries to take care of us. It grabs onto all that is possibly wrong so that we can be prepared for that and ready ourselves to react to all of that. Now, you can understand how if this is what is happening during a time of crisis, and we are now eight months into this global pandemic, uh, indeed a time of widespread crisis, you can understand then how the going gets much more tough for some families, for their children, and for the community around them. The other thing that we know uh, plays out for uh, kids and families when they're struggling is that they are plunged into being primed for alarm and having hypervigilance always 
always on board because they must be ready for the other shoe to drop. Um, when we heard um, uh, our speaker this morning, Janine, talking about um, her experience as a mother, you can hear in uh, her daily lived experience of being a mother of a child who is struggling that there is constantly this undercurrent uh, of alarm and this necessity to be hypervigilant. And while we are meant um, through our evolutionary history to have the capacity to be primed for alarm and hypervigilance because it allows us to keep ourselves safe. We are not meant to be that in an enduring kind of way. When we have to live in alarm and live in hypervigilance, it is actually toxic to our brains and toxic to our bodies. And you can hear sort of the ripple effect of that playing out through the family system. Um, and indeed, when we think about this at the community level, you can imagine what it is for a child to breathe the air of a community that also sits in alarm and hypervigilance. The other piece of this is that when we are in a state of crisis, anxious, alarmed, uh, we aren't able to really think our way out of it. And so we have to understand that this isn't going to come down to logic. We don't convince children to not be worried about things. We invite children to feel safe and we create conditions around the child that are conducive to emotional safety. And when the child can feel safe, then we begin the process through neuroplasticity, the brain's openness to external influence of rewiring that brain to be a brain that isn't quite so good at being um, dysregulated and rather a brain that is more able to hang on to the regulatory capacities of the human mind and the body. And so we need to be figuring out how do we create that experience of safety in an enduring kind of way for children, for their families, and for their communities from the top down so that we all get to rest into that experience of safety and most importantly, see our children grow through that experience. As we're um, continuing on with thinking about survival, there's this thing that has started to happen and the thing that is happening is it's really, really hard to feel full of anxiety. It's really, really hard to be stuck in the darkness of depression. And it's really hard, even if you're not deep in anxiety or depression, it's hard to look at the world around us, especially right now, and to have these waves of sadness pass through us, to have these, you know, crushing experience of worry about finances or job security or the other kinds of things that are happening for families right now. And because it feels yucky to be plunged into the depths of those kinds of emotions, um, the, the challenge that families have uh, and children and all of us have is we want to get out of the feeling very quickly. And so we work to try to anesthetize ourselves against the experience of what we have characterized as the bad feelings. We don't want to feel mad and sad and all of that kind of stuff. We want to anesthetize ourselves out of that. And so we see um, children and adults um, who are working really hard to not have their feelings be felt all the way. Um, uh, you know, the binging on the Netflix shows or um, using food or substances or other kinds of things in order to be able to push through the feelings uh, and not hit the bottom with those feelings. And problematically, uh, what we know in the field of um, mental health and psychology is that you actually have to feel all the feels. And it is only when you get to the very bottom of the feeling, it's like a ball that falls towards the ground and it hits the bottom and compresses. And from the compression, you get the bounce back. And so there needs to be systems in place that allow for parents and their children to feel all the feelings to not have to hurry out of the cry or the sadness, to not have to uh, hurry out of the madness, that we have supports in place around that can hold space and invite um, children to, to feel and emote the way that they need to feel and emote. Um, one of the things that Freud said amongst many things was that which stays in festers and comes forth later in uglier ways, which means that we need to invite the 
expression of all it is that families and children are feeling right now so that they too get to have the experience of the bounce back. We also need to be shining a light on some of these sort of key simple things that um, people can access in order to be preventative around mental health. One of those simple things is coming back to the body and coming back to um, uh, simple physiological overrides like breathing. And when we can breathe in a circular kind of way, air coming in through the nose, being held in the body, and then pressing back out through the mouth, and air that goes all the way down, air that doesn't get stuck in the chest, but that hits the very bottom of our bellies. When we can breathe in that kind of way, we actually begin to physiologically override um, the alarm responding of the nervous system. And so if we can start to uh, create some general education, I heard Janine talk about sensory uh, boxes and, um, and putting tools together for kids in that way. There's a lot of overarching information that we can be disseminating to families and to communities about coming alongside parents of their kids. Uh, something as simple as getting them to breathe um, and to pausing in breath in order to ground oneself and not be so taken over by the tidal wave of the feelings. The other thing, and I, and I want for people to really hear this at the level of community and on down, this is a challenge. We are actually in our relative infancy in terms of making complete sense of childhood mental health and knowing how to best treat and respond to children and families who are struggling. And so when we struggle along the way, when it doesn't go quite right, for um, you know, a school, a teacher, a child, a parent, that we find compassion within ourselves to be gentle around that for ourselves and for others. Because this is a tough road to be walking and it's an especially tough road to be walking right now. And so our um, local provincial health officer, Dr. Bonnie Henry, she has this um, phrase that she's been using all through the pandemic, which is to be safe and be kind and be calm and really extending compassion to ourselves and to others uh, is an incredibly important thing for us to be uh, landing on right now. When it comes to the world of mental health, it's also incredibly important for us to be aware of the narratives that we are creating around mental health. There is a way at coming at the narrative that is quite deficits based, and there is a way at coming at the narrative that is really strengths based. And when we can be strengths based in the way that we understand mental health, in the way that we understand the incredible capacity of parents and families and children to be adaptive and resilient, when we use that kind of language and create systems that are full of um, those kinds of supports, supports that have been flavored with a strength-based understanding of who kids are and what makes their world go around, um, then we actually empower families. When we come at it through a deficit-based lens, where we think there's a giant problem, the child is broken, the family is broken, uh, they need fixing, then we run into um, big challenges. And so we really want to make sure that we are very impeccable with our word around this and that we endeavor to be strengths based in all of the ways that we are conceptualizing mental health for kids and working to make sense of that. We also, as far as education, wanna get people outside and we wanna get people moving because we know that being out in nature is incredibly positive for the brain and the body and the mind and the soul. And we also know through um, uh, science that if you can elevate your heart rate for roughly 30 minutes a day, that this changes the brain chemistry of the person uh, who engaged in the exercise for the better. And there's some research looking at the impact of counseling and uh, psychological supports compared to the impact of being physically active every day. And we know that physical activity is indeed incredibly potent when it comes to um, increasing our mental health and wellness. And as I uh, come into the finish line of my talk with you today, I want to land once again on the importance of being connected. What can we be doing to allow parents 
to be incredibly present in their children's lives in a way that really makes sense to the child? How are we showing up to support the parent so that the parent doesn't have to be at the effect of what it feels like to be, you know, now unemployed at home caring for a child because life as they knew it before can't continue to exist in that way? How do we care for the parents so the parent shows up to care for the child? How do we create capacity within the system through being connected? Because we now, through the science of child development, through all of the work of the attachment theorists over the years, that um, our social species demands connection in order for us to both survive and indeed for us to thrive. And during this pandemic, as we are working to talk about connection, we know that one of the ways we are meant to be keeping ourselves and our families safe is to actually be physically um, distanced from one another. And you've heard the languaging of using social distancing as keeping us safe during the pandemic. I really want to encourage you to not say so social distancing. Right now, we need to be physically distanced and socially connected as never before. And in those social connections, try to have them be as real as possible. Because we know when we have the benefit of uh, staring into the whites of one another's eyes, um, of hearing voice, of those kinds of things, that it goes a long way to settling into the psyche um, of the um, person that we are connected with and actually changing the brain chemistry and changing how things are uh, wired up from there. And and finally, we have previously, when we look at the um, history, uh, the way our ancestors raised our young, they were always raised uh, in the village with systems and community all around them. And Bruce Perry, a world-renowned trauma expert, um, has very eloquently highlighted that we are right now raising children in relative isolation because the natural village and the natural community no longer exist for families. And so it is our job to figure out how we recreate that, how we um, have the feeling of being nested in an actual community that champions parent, so parent can champion child, that we figure out how to go to the village because parents were never meant to do this alone. And a lot of parents, especially parents of children who are struggling right now, feel very much alone indeed on their path um, to trying to support mental wellness in their children. Oh. Vanessa, thank you so much. Um, incredible presentation. I invited Vanessa to speak because a, a colleague of mine said that she'd seen Vanessa speak at an event and thought she was the best speaker on the topic that she'd ever seen. And uh, I can certainly see why she would have said that. Thank you so much. We've run out of time for Q&A with Vanessa, but she will join us on the panel discussion. At the end of the um, at the end of the session, so we'll have questions for her then. Now to bring a whole new perspective on healing, please welcome Alex Korb, PhD, who's a UCLA neuroscientist, speaker, blogger, and best-selling author of a book called *Upward Spiral*. Using neuroscience to reverse the course of depression, one small change at a time. As a consultant, Alex also works with organizations to improve communication about neuroscience and enhance employee well-being. And as a coach, he's worked with the UCLA Women's Ultimate Frisbee team for more than 15 years and is three-time winner of the USA's Ultimate Coach of the Year. And he's also a stand-up comic. So um, let's Welcome, Alex Korb. Hello, Alex. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Uh, ah, you're really welcome. To be a part of this uh, this great conference. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, uh, as Joanne said, uh, my name is Dr. Alex Korb. I'm a neuroscientist, author, and coach. And uh, um, and yes, I used to do stand up comedy. Um, I don't do stand up comedy anymore. Um, but don't worry, I'm still funny, uh, though my wife hates that joke. Um, but uh, uh, I've been studying neuroscience for about 20 years, and I'm excited to tell you about um, applied positive neuroscience, which is about how you can use 
an understanding of your brain to enhance your well-being. Uh, and today I'm going to share with you uh, the most important thing I've learned about the link between well-being and the brain and how it can be used to reverse the course of the downward spirals of anxiety and depression. Uh, and in all the research I've done and uh, articles I've studied, uh, whispers of this concept just kept coming up over and over again. And I started to realize that it was the key to being calmer, happier, and more resilient in the face of stress. Uh, I call it the upward spiral. And I've written two books about it. Uh, and the idea might sound really obvious or really profound, and it's both uh, really. Um, but the idea is simply this, that by making small changes in your thoughts, actions, interactions, and environment, it's possible to actually change the activity and chemistry of key brain circuits that contribute to mood, motivation, resilience, and more. Uh, and because I'm a neuroscientist uh, who studies depression and I've got access to um, an fMRI machine, uh, people are always asking me, uh, like, what's wrong with my brain? Can't you just scan me and tell me, like, I know I'm missing something or I've got a tumor somewhere? Uh, and uh, I, I've come to realize, like, there's a, there's a general answer for this. And maybe uh, you can spot the difference if you look at the depressed brain on the left and the healthy brain on the right. Um, no, just kidding. They're the same one, uh, which is uh, to not to say that there's never anything wrong with your brain. It's just that often in depression, it, it feels like there's something wrong, but there's nothing technically, quote unquote, wrong with the brain in depression uh, or anxiety. Uh, there's no brain scan or EEG or lab test or MRI that you can use to diagnose depression. Yes, if you take you know, 20 people with depression and 20 people without, and you scan their brains and you in very controlled laboratory settings, you can find on average subtle differences. Uh, but that doesn't mean you can look at an individual and point to say, oh, that's something wrong with your brain. So whether you have depression or anxiety or not, we all have the same brain circuits. Uh, those conditions are a result of subtle changes in the tuning of various brain circuits. Uh, and the brain circuits that contribute to depression and anxiety are the same ones that control habits and mood and uh, decision-making and enjoyment and more. Uh, and to, to help you understand that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about like how the brain works in general. Uh, you see, your brain is full of intricate and interacting neural circuits. And I know because uh, it says so right there. Uh, but <laughs> there's that, you know, there's a circuit for planning and worrying and a circuit for enjoyment and mood and memory and circuits for habit and addiction and pain uh, and circuits for just about everything else. And a lot of them are overlapping, uh, but they also interact and communicate with each other. Uh, and the tuning of each circuit varies from person to person. So some people worry more, some people worry less, some people are more decisive, some people are less decisive. And uh, there's nothing really inherently better or worse about being, you know, towards one end or towards the other end on a particular circuit. It's the combination of them that can sometimes lead to problems. Uh, so depression and anxiety, like there's not some specific thing you can point to. They're patterns of activity and reactivity that the brain gets stuck in. They're not a problem with one specific brain region or chemical. They're, um, they're a problem with how the thinking and feeling and habit and reward circuits primarily uh, are communicating with 
and regulating each other. Uh, and all this complexity means that there's no one big solution to solving all depression and anxiety uh, for everyone. Uh, and yet, there are dozens of tiny solutions that can each contribute in varying degrees. Uh, and before I talk more about those solutions, uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about how these brain circuits can get stuck. Because sometimes when I say, well, there's nothing wrong with the brain, people are like, well, clearly there's something, you know, going on, there's a big problem in my life, I'm depressed or anxious. How is there nothing wrong with my brain? And all these circuits in the brain uh, are, are feedback circuits because they all communicate with each other. So often the output uh, of one circuit goes into the other circuit and the output of that goes back into this. So there's all, all this information, chemical and electrical information swirling around in your brain. And that can be a bit abstract. So I just wanted to simplify it to talk about a simple feedback circuit, just to sort of illustrate an analogy of how there can be a problem, uh, but there not technically be anything wrong with the brain. Uh, and so think of the simple feedback circuit like a microphone and a speaker. Uh, if the, the volume on the speaker is turned up just a little too loud or the the microphone is oriented in just a particular way. Uh, even a normal sounding sound level of speech can lead to like screeching feedback. And don't worry, I'm not going to demonstrate uh, this. Uh, but that's like an objective problem. Everyone's covering their ears. It's a problem. And yet, there's nothing wrong with the microphone. There's nothing wrong with the speaker. Both are working exactly as they are supposed to. The problem arises from the specific tuning of the circuit and the interaction of those parts. And so the solution doesn't need to be as drastic as, oh my God, you need to, you have a broken microphone, you get a new microphone. Well, sometimes you just turn the microphone a little bit in a different way or uh, just turn down the volume a tiny bit on the uh, on the speaker and the problem might go away. And I think that's one of the best ways to think about all these little interventions that you can do. You're just turning down the volume or the reactivity of these various circuits and that can just dramatically um, uh, ameliorate the issue. Uh, and even another good example of this analogy is like one solution is possibly to stop shouting into the microphone. And you can sort of think of that as th those are the controllable aspects uh, of your life that you're you know, inadvertently maybe doing that are, that are stressing out your brain more and contributing to your depression. So uh, when it comes to your life, like, well, if you just stop stressing yourself out so much or stopped, uh, uh, um, you know, hanging out with people you didn't like, uh, I mean, just, uh, not to, um, uh, dismiss the complexity of it, but uh, sometimes there are little things that you can do that we don't realize that we're contributing to our own sense of feeling stuck. Uh, now, the uh, this collection of solutions that I sort of alluded to, as I said, there's no one big solution. I, I take this collection of solutions and I, I call that the upward spiral uh, because it's simpler to sort of have one idea in your head than uh, 20. Uh, but I didn't come up with this idea of the upward spiral. Um, it's been around for a long time. And uh, in research, it was first popularized by the psychologist Barbara Fredrickson. And she described it as the idea that positive action and positive thoughts tend to lead to positive emotions, which lead to further positive actions and further positive thoughts. And I agree with that. But as a neuroscientist, I like to think of it in terms of the brain. And so I describe it as the idea that positive life changes, even really small positive life changes, lead to positive brain changes. And that those positive brain changes make further positive life changes more accessible. 
Uh, that might sound a bit abstract, so I'm gonna give you three snapshots of studies that highlight our new understanding of neuroscience and how we can use it to shape the activity and chemistry uh, of our brains. Uh, in this first study, researchers at the University of Wisconsin conducted a functional MRI scan of married women uh, so they could look at their brain activity. Um, I realize I need to advance this slide. Uh, while they administered a series of electric shocks. Uh, you know, so don't worry, they, got, they volunteered for this. Uh, so they put the woman inside an MRI machine and strap an electrode to her ankle. And uh, they give her a computer screen that would alert her that she was about to get shocked because they weren't interested in what happened in her brain when she got shocked. They were interested in what happened in her brain while she was sitting there in a state of worry and apprehension. And a, a predictable set of brain regions lit up, ones responsible for worry and detecting danger. Then they repeated the experiment, this time bringing the woman's husband in to hold her hand. Uh, she still got the same shocks and the same warnings, but her brain response had changed with the uh, worrying and danger circuits calming down. And this image shows the, uh, the regions that had significantly less activity during hand-holding. Uh, and the acronym stands for the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the ventral anterior cingulate cortex, but I won't overload you uh, with the details. Uh, and the researchers did this in a, in a counterbalanced way. So some women did the hand-holding first and some got it second. Uh, so it wasn't just them getting used to being shocked. The idea is that these regions uh, were involved, that, that were involved in the anxious apprehension uh, simply by having her husband hold her hand, they significantly reduced their activity. Uh, in this second study, uh, researchers in Japan, Japan uh, used um, infrared light sensors to measure subtle blood flow changes in the brain uh, while uh, participants rode on a stationary bike. And um, by the way, scientists love stationary bikes because it makes it so much easier to record from someone's brain where you don't have to like chase after them. Uh, but they found that just 15 minutes of biking was sufficient to increase activity in these prefrontal circuits responsible for emotional control. And these were accompanied by uh, changes in serotonin, which is the primary neurotransmitter system targeted by antidepressant medications. And in this, this third study, uh, and the final study I'll, I'll talk about here is um, at, a university in, at the University of Pittsburgh, um, Doctors were studying uh, patients who were recovering from painful spinal surgery to understand why some people seem to have an easier time than others. Uh, and they noticed that it seemed to have something to do with which side of the hallway they were on. See, so one side of the hallway um, had windows that were bright and sunny, uh, while the other side stared straight at another building. So they went around to each room with light sensors and they went back into the patient records to see how much pain medication they needed to control their symptoms. And they found that patients on the dim side needed about four milligrams of morphine per hour to control their symptoms, while patients on the bright side needed about 25% less. Uh, with, the, with the sunlight helping the brain to produce its own form of painkillers. Now, that's not gonna solve the opioid crisis, uh, but something as simple as sunlight was equivalent to about a milligram of morphine per hour. And uh, that just sort of highlights the, the fact that there's not only one big solution, uh, but there's just little tiny solutions that can make the, the next change a little bit easier and the next, so you don't have to try and solve everything all at once. And there's so many little things uh, you can do to change your brain's activity. I'm not gonna go into all of them, the idea is just that uh, there are many different things you can do. Uh, so you realize that if you're feeling stuck, it's not permanent. You have the power to change your brain and change the tuning of these various circuits. And in the last uh, uh, couple of minutes, I just wanted to highlight one particular aspect of the upward spiral, which is something that's often overlooked in traditional approaches to treating depression uh, and anxiety, and that's gratitude. 
Uh, and I figured since it's Thanksgiving here in the US, that's another uh, great reason to talk about gratitude. Uh, gratitude is about focusing on the um, uh, uh, um, parts of reality that you appreciate. Um, you can think about uh, the classic example of a cup of water that's half full or half empty. Uh, are you focusing on how much water you have to enjoy or the water that you don't have? And even if it was 90% empty, you could still be grateful for that little sip. Even if it doesn't quench your thirst, you don't have to pretend that it's enough. You can want more and still acknowledge your appreciation for what you have. Uh, sometimes we don't feel grateful for what we have because of all the things that we don't have. Uh, but what you have and what you don't have don't have to like do battle against each other. And when I say practice gratitude, I wanna be clear, I don't mean you should practice feeling grateful. You don't have control over your feelings. I mean to practice orienting your attention towards the parts of your reality that you appreciate. And if you can do that, research has shown that there's benefits to um, reduce stress and improvements in depression and anxiety symptoms, improvements in sleep, uh, reductions in, uh, in pain and improvements in, uh, in your um, immune system, as well as a stronger sense of social support. And I'll end with just this little uh, study that was done in Canada where they asked people to think about positive memories. Uh, these positive memories are things that are part of you, you always carry with you. Uh, and uh, these are a few of my positive memories. And there are studies shown that if you think about positive memories from your past, it actually changes uh, serotonin metabolism in a key part of your brain's emotional circuitry. Uh, and so when you're suffering from depression or anxiety, it's like being stuck on a road that's taking you where you don't want to go. Uh, and that's because your brain is stuck in certain patterns of activity and reactivity that are self-reinforcing. And so when you're depressed or anxious, the brain makes you want to do things that keep you anxious or depressed. But the good news is you can do something about it. All you have to do is make one little change that's different than your default, and that makes the next little change a little bit easier and the next. So when you're feeling stuck, the possibility is always there to create a new path forward. Thank you. Oh. Thank you for listening. Sorry for going on perhaps a little too long. No, Alex, thank you so much. And I love your I love your talk about gratitude. And in fact, in the new year, we're doing a podcast about gratitude with one of the foremost researchers on that topic um, who lives in the United Kingdom. So um, I'll let everyone know about that as, as it uh, unfolds. It's my great pleasure now to introduce Andy Greenshaw, PhD and FRSA who's a researcher and professor of psychiatry and neuroscience at the University of Alberta. Andy has broad interests in biological psychiatry and behavioral neuroscience. His research focuses on the application of technology, particularly machine learning and data mining to help diagnose and treat mental illness. Andy is also scientific director of the APEC Digital Hub for Mental Health that will serve the combined population of 2.7 billion people in the Pacific Rim, including indigenous stakeholders. Andy, thanks so much for being here. And uh, just a side note, I first met Andy when he worked with me on a podcast about depression which will be uploaded to our website soon. And uh, you'll hear more from this, this amazing mind. So welcome, Andy. Thank you, Joe. It's very nice to see you. And I really appreciate the invitation to participate in the conference. All I was right. listening to some of the presentations. I really enjoyed Alex's snapshot of uh, an approach to positive thinking. So. I like to talk about um, interesting things that people can relate to very well. So I'm talking about big data and these new advanced techniques like machine learning that is a basic part of what we think of as artificial intelligence. 
So I'm going to start with a story that I told Joe a while ago. I had a symposium in Shanghai. I work with lots of Chinese and other international colleagues. So I was in Shanghai organizing the symposium, running it. And the symposium next door was uh, about innovation in aging. So I thought, well, great, I would go and listen because it was given by the vice president for AI for Alibaba. And Alibaba is a little bit uh, like Amazon, you probably realize, in, in the US. So big company, big trading, but they're interested in AI and gadgets. So the VP for AI gave a little demonstration of a chat bot. So you're all familiar probably with Siri or Alexa, the little bot that sits on the table, the speaker bot. Well, Alibaba made a chat bot that they called Timal Genie, Magic Genie, and they gave it vision. So it had two visual sensors, it could speak, it could hear, it looks a little bit like a Hello Kitty thing. And it's in an old lady's apartment in Beijing. She's old and, you know, failing in health and a little infirm on her own. She wakes up. And this chatbot says, hello, Ping, how are you this morning? And Ping said, well, I'm not feeling very well. I, my back is hurting me. And the chatbot says, you should take your medication. And she says, I think I took my medication. Chatbot says, I didn't see you take your medication, Ping. I think you need to take your medication. And she says, you know, I can never remember which one it is. I have all these pill bottles. And the chatbot says, well, why don't you show me? So she shows the chatbot her little pill bottle, and the chatbot says, these are the wrong pills. Ping, you want the blue ones, not the brown ones. And I can see from the label that your prescription is running out. Would you like me to order some more at the pharmacy for you? And Ping's, yeah, that would be great. She takes her pill, she's scuttling about. And the chatbot says, so what are you planning to do today, Ping? And she said, I think I'll go and see my daughter. And the chatbot says, well, it's going to rain today, Ping, so that's a great idea to see your daughter, but remember to take your umbrella. And would you like me to call your daughter to let her know you're on your way? And this was really amazing. Every time I talk to people who have elderly relatives about this chatbot, they say, I'd really like to get one of those for my elderly mom. And I say, does your elderly mom speak Mandarin? No. I said, well, we don't have one in English yet, but the reason I tell this story is you can imagine the companionship that comes by having a voice that's comforting and supporting and has some information. The chatbot's not conscious, but it has appropriate responses. And if you have information about somebody that needs to be supported and you have such a device, you have a great way of supporting somebody. If we think about the current era in which we are, unfortunately with COVID-19, uh, a lot of social isolation, a lot of physical distancing. The power of machine learning and AI and building things like that chatbot is quite remarkable in terms of how it might change our lives and support us. I spend a lot of my time doing international collaboration, a lot of my time talking about how we can support people by collecting a lot of data and learning about their patterns and responses. And there are lots of great things that are blossoming onto the scene. If you look at uh, the media, you know, Google it or whatever your favorite browser is around AI and health, you'll see various things um, that provide lots of physical health support things. I was looking on the, the television about um, a mobile phone um, e ECG analysis for, for heart profiles and heart rate. Um, very comforting to people with heart disease. There are possibilities to look at self-monitoring of health in terms of mental health, the depression and anxiety, the things that Alex was talking about. To get there, um, there's a lot of really advanced complex technology. We started playing in this area uh, over 10 years ago now, looking at the imaging stuff that Alex was talking about, basically with functional magnetic resonance imaging, where you can look at images of the brain, compare between groups of people, and see what kind of changes happen functionally. A bit like the happy thoughts leading to changes in serotonin metabolism that Alex talked about. To do that, um, it's very complex um, analysis, and you know, 
as a normal person, I can think in four dimensions on a good day, space and time. Those applications we have to constrain to a 70 million dimensional space. And so you can imagine the power of comparing 70 million variables at the same time. The predictive capacity of that is huge. So we've moved into an era where people are building models based on machine learning that will take a massive amount of data from a population of healthy patients, and let's say patients suffering from uh, depression or psychosis, and by analyzing their brain data from imaging techniques, we can make predictive statements about, are these people, if they're not symptomatic yet, are they likely to develop a disease? Is it likely to be severe? Are they likely to respond to a certain treatment? And so we end up in a domain where we have the possibility of very accurate decisions that can guide how we support people before they become ill, if they have that potential, um, across a range of things, mood disorders, psychosis, addiction that Alex mentioned. Um, and we can really have a good predictive idea of what kind of medications or treatments are going to be effective for those people. Now that can only be really understood in terms of value when you see that I work in a department of psychiatry and my colleagues would confirm that you see a patient coming to the office, the patient is depressed, it's appropriate to prescribe a medication for that patient. Lamentably, there's probably a 50% chance of getting it right in terms of understanding which drug will be most efficacious or which treatment will be most efficacious. But if you can apply machine learning to a whole set of population data, you can get to a much higher predictive value. So we get up to 80% predictive success for these things, not in clinical use, still in, in kind of uh, development phase, but we believe those kinds of predictions are possible. Now, when people think about computers and the precision of decisions, people often think, well, you know, why isn't it 100%? Why isn't it perfect? But in fact, for us as patients, for us as people struggling with things in our lives, what we really need is a better outcome. So if the physician gives you an outcome of 50 or 60% success, and a machine gives you an outcome of 80% success, most of us would go, machine, please. There are lots of ethical issues and issues around the quality of interacting with humans and the relationship piece that is super important. We're social beings, we like to interact with each other. COVID has been a really difficult adjustment for lots of people. And you know, we've moved really into a digital age in a way we hadn't before. Many of us didn't really use video conferencing. A lot of people have used FaceTime and things like that, but a lot of people have just stuck to email and phones. But since COVID, everybody's doing face-to-face -face video chats. And the story I told you in the beginning about the Magic Genie chatbot gives you a little window on, actually, you may be able to quite soon have a conversation with an AI entity, which would be a chatbot, perhaps something in your home, uh, perhaps something on a screen, we're going through a transition. In my discussions about chatbots with people, a lot of people talk about apps to support mental health where you actually have to type in and you read what happens on the screen. My message to people constantly is people normally converse and we have the kind of technology now that allows natural language processing with big data and AI. And so we're moving into a domain where we want to get machines to speak to us so that we can speak to them in a naturalistic way and make it much easier to interact. You know, I'd say that most people with depression don't really want to drag themselves over to a keyboard and start typing in things. If you can talk to somebody or if you can talk to a voice that responds appropriately, that's a lot more powerful, a lot more supportive. So, AI and big data, uh, fantastic possibilities. In the time I've got with you today, I can only give you a little snapshot. If anybody's interested, I'd love to hear from people with questions about 
what's happening, what's hot, what's not, what's possible. And certainly um, we may have time for questions in this, these sessions today, but if not, feel free to, to, get, to get hold of me. Well, the ways that we're developing things um, is more and more looking at interactions on the internet. Um, in, in the domain in which I live in Alberta, we have a wonderful psychiatrist, Vincent Agupong, one of my colleagues who's a very innovative researcher, and we work together on supportive text messaging. The supportive text messaging is really remarkable. So people sign up because they, they want to do better. There have been different programs. The, the most recent one is called Text for Hope that was designed for people dealing with issues in COVID. And um, so people are feeling isolated, feeling alone. And if you sign up for Text for Hope, every morning you get one message. And the message is constructed based on what we would call cognitive behavior therapy. An example would be, you know, it's like old wise sayings. An example would be, don't worry about the things you have no control over. Focus on the things that you can do something about and focus on positive things in your life. A bit like the upward spiral that Alex was talking about. We've done lots of evaluation on this on thousands of people who signed up. And in fact, that single text message in a day is quite efficacious. It raises people's mood, decreases stress, uh, decreases anxiety, um, helps in, in many ways. Uh, that's a very simple digital intervention. You can look for a lot more development in terms of how computers and AI and um, machine learning will help right across the medical field. But at the same time, there's a, a cautionary note I'll give you. Just because an app is on the internet doesn't mean it's effective. And it's very difficult to figure out what is of good quality and what isn't. Uh, one of my colleagues at Harvard, John Torres, has written extensively about this and has analyzed a lot of apps. So people put out a lot of apps, like computer games. If you ask kids who, of all ages who like computer games, they'll say, well, these are good, but these are all awful. Um, and many of the claims for apps are not well substantiated. So if you really want to look at some kind of app that's going to be supportive or helpful, do some consumer research. Look at what other people have said and look at how long the app's been around and if there's evidence that it's effective. And also apps have different styles. Uh, there's one called Wobot that I really like, which is uh, one of these typing uh, chatbots. Some people find it annoying because it keeps coming back saying, hey, I haven't heard from you for a while. It's about time we interacted. Um, I think that's helpful as a kind of prompt to engage people. But my favorite idea is like um, Magic Genie from Alibaba. And we're working on trying to develop something like that because we think that will be the next stage. Um, as the famous Albertan hockey player said, Wayne Gretzky, you don't want to concentrate on where the puck is. You want to concentrate on where the puck is going to be. And my predictive statement for today is the puck is going to be centered around natural language and chatbots. Um, that will turn into robotics. You know, you see things like the robotic vacuum cleaner. If you went to some Asian airports, last time I was in, um, in Seoul Airport uh, in South Korea, um, with my two youngest children we were walking along, and there was a robot talking to people. Uh, robotics and chatbots coming together represent a huge set of help, especially in the current time of distancing for COVID-19. So I'm just about up for time. I like to stick to the time I'm given. I'm sorry I didn't have a chance to talk to you about more things, but I hope I've given you a little glimpse on what's happening in the not too distant future around big data, AI, and machine learning. Thanks for listening today. Ah, oh, thank you so much, Andy. Just blows the mind of a card carrying technophobe. Have to tell you that. <laughs> um, just hoping that we can bring uh, Javid and Alex back on. We have about uh, seven minutes that we can devote to q a for these two um amazing noodles that we've been we've been picking here and uh javid i'd love to to have you start with the question i know you're you're just bursting 
Yeah, I think uh, I appreciate both presentations. One of the things I was struck with is there's a, a central need, I think, in society right now that emphasizes fixing things, right? Intervening, doing, fixing. And uh, in the context of the pandemic, I think we're all appreciating that we can't fix everything. There are times where um, we might have heavy emotions and rather than fix them, we need to focus to maybe more of an acceptance-based or even a meaning-based way of coping with them. So I, that's my question to both of you. Um, how can we help sort of counter some of that narrative around fixing and intervening? How can we unlearn that need to fix um, for many people we work with? So maybe I'll, can I kick off, Alex? I'll, I'll just say that different strokes for different folks. So some people are very resilient. Um, that can be pathological. You, we've all met the person that doesn't need anything. Um, I, can, I, can t I can deal with it. And those people are resilient to a point, and then they tend to crumble. Everybody has a breaking point. I think listening to people and understanding what they need is really important. And, you know, from the, the big data AI piece, putting a really human flavor on this, moving from the neuroimaging stuff that Alex was talking about out into the affirmative statement stuff that Alex was talking about, it was a great uh, panoply of things there. I think we need to understand the cognitive and emotional styles of people and be able to catch them before they fall. And the last thing that somebody wants to be told, I mean, it's the very Victorian idea being English, I'll use that analogy, of pull your socks up, stop whining, you can do this. It's completely pointless. And as we move into a society that's more focused on equity, diversity, and inclusion, we understand that people really um, are in unfortunate circumstances, sometimes not because of their own actions or inactions, but because that's the circumstance they're in. And we have to approach them with respect and kindness and compassion, try and support them. Anybody watching CNN and listening to some people who had a very solid, great, stable lives who've been affected by unemployment and COVID, people at all stages of society, it's heartbreaking to see those food lineups. But there's a real lesson in that. We have to listen to what people need. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the... Uh... Uh, one of the things that I, I mean, I agree with the um, with Javid and Andy, and one of the things I notice sometimes that's problematic with me talking about the upward spiral is it gives the impression to people that they should have full and total control over their brains, and that sometimes leads to self criticism, like, oh, well, you, you, I just need to exercise more, and I just need to do this, and I just need to do that. And like, it, it's important to realize that. Yes, your biology is malleable and can be reshaped, but it is also shaped by things that you cannot control. It is shaped by your genetics. It's shaped by, you know, your early childhood experiences. It's shaped by the environment that you're in. And it's important, one of the reasons why I like to talk about the neuroscience is for you to realize, ah, there's these things that I can't control that shape my biology. And for those things, I should just accept them. Uh, and for the things that I can control, I should try to change them. And a lot of our problems come because we uh, make mistakes about which is which. We're trying to control things that we can't control, like how our parents raised us, uh, or we fail to control things that we can do, like uh, just have a good night's sleep or eat a snack, uh, little tiny things that will uh, push us in the right direction. And the, the challenge is finding the balance between those.
Welcome back. Our next guest is Dr. Louis Mayo Madrona, a Native American physician and psychiatrist who's going to talk about the benefits of coupling Indigenous traditional medicine with contemporary practices to achieve the best mental health care possible. Lewis trained at Stanford University and has taught at numerous medical schools. He is a director of the Coyote Institute for Studies of Change and Transformation, which uses what's called two-eyed seeing to celebrate Indigenous knowledge and wisdom while appreciating the insights of academic science. To that end, Lewis has written a number of books, including Coyote Medicine, Coyote Healing, and Coyote Wisdom, a trilogy of what Native culture has to offer the modern world. Thank you so much for joining us, Lewis. Thank you. So I'll be talking about the idea of two-eyed seeing today. And it was it was hard to choose what to present in 15 minutes. So I thought the most important thing would be to talk about a way of seeing Indigenous knowledge as equally valid to contemporary biomedical knowledge. So uh, this is how to get a hold of me. And uh, this is my lovely wife, Barbara, who helped me to make these slides. So Elder Albert Marshall of Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, originated the term two-eyed seeing. Albert is, is one of the original people of the Wabanaki, the people of the Don, which are the uh, groups of indigenous people who live where I live in Maine. Uh, and um, Albert came up, uh, this idea exists in next slide, in um, Mi'kmaq, which is uh, the tribe of Albert as Eptuoptimunk. And so in 2004, Albert got together with Judy Bartlett at Cape Breton University to create a center for integrative science. And the whole idea of two-eyed seeing is really spreading across Canada like wildfire. And sadly, it's not so common in, in the United States, but um, it's the idea that you can look at the world through the lens of contemporary biomedicine, and you can look at the world through the lens of indigenous wisdom and that one doesn't have to reduce to the other. Next slide. So, um, so two-eyed seeing, the concept applies equally well, I think, to any marginalized population whose knowledge systems, whose epistemologies are um, trivialized by the dominant culture. So, so two-eyed seeing is a way to appreciate the wisdom of the indigenous world, which perhaps has some important lessons for survival. And we'll talk a little bit about the idea of interconnectedness, that every part of the world is connected to every part, other part of the world, and that every part of the world is interdependent on every other part of the world. And I, and I think we need to know that. We need to practice that for survival. So the idea is that we should leave the world a better place and for seven generations forward. Now, um, my tribe is Lakota. So for us, seven generations is, is 140 years, but for the Mi'kmaq, it's 840 years. So a little bit different. Next slide. So this is Albert, and uh, in Mi'kmaq, there's a word, Nitukulimik, and, and I apologize to native speakers if I'm not saying that correctly. Um, I practiced. So the concept is um, coexistence, interrelatedness, interconnectedness, and community spirit, that these are the essential core concepts of indigenous science. Next slide. And, and so two-eyed seeing is about how to live while on the earth in all aspects of our lives. It's, it's 
always looking for another perspective and wondering what is the what's the best way to do something next slide so this is a picture of the current home of two-eyed seeing at cape breton university this is unamaki college uh, unamaki is a Mi'kmaq word referring to the people of that region and uh, so unamaki college is part of cape breton university and i invite you to visit their website because it's it's a marvelous resource. Next slide. And um, this is just another um, vision of their website. So let's keep going. Next slide. So so the idea is that indigenous knowledge comes from consensus-driven systemic observations of how things work, resulting in explanations that are useful and appealing and that these explanations don't need to make sense to the dominant paradigm to be effective and practical so uh, next slide so as an example um, indigenous explanations of mental health talk about um, the importance of transmission of inheritance of the deeds and acts of our ancestors. Of course, now we, we have the biomedical concept of epigenetics, which essentially says the same thing. But uh, indigenous science um, had epigenetics before contemporary science. So indigenous science says that what really matters is relationship. But it's all about relationship and the interconnectedness and interdependence of each of us on each other. And um, that, that we're, we're in this together, it takes a village, altruism matters. So um, two-eyed seeing is the opposite of positivism, which is the philosophy of contemporary biomedicine, which is that there is one cause and science will find it and that explanations exclude each other so that a full explanation excludes all other explanations which is what eliminates and trivializes indigenous wisdom and knowledge next slide and it's also the opposite of reductionism so it it's not the case in indigenous thinking that the smallest theory the microstructural theory explains things the best. So take love for an example. Regardless of, of how well you can describe the hormones that are associated with romance and love, it, it doesn't help you maintain a relationship. That, that these are macro skills that cannot be explained by reducing to the microstructural level. Next slide. And, and so all of the knowledge of the neural circuitry involved in depression and all of the knowledge of the neurochemicals will not explain why relationship and talking together within that relationship makes people feel better. Similarly, knowledge of the brain circuitry involved in meditation does not explain meditation or its beneficial effects. Next slide. So explanations can exist at multiple levels and an explanation on one level need not be compatible or explainable by an explanation on another level. Next slide. And so we choose explanations based upon their usefulness and their aesthetics, recognizing that different explanations work in different contexts and that more than one explanation is often required to account for a given phenomena. Next slide. So what are some other ideas from indigenous knowledge? That we learn to be who we are. We're not born that way. We are born into relationships that determine who we become through the stories we are told. 
we absorb those stories and those stories lead us to certain conclusions which are called beliefs. So we as people are co-constructed by all of our relationships within a community and all of the stories that arise from those relationships. Next slide. That, um, so elders carry knowledge of both physical and spiritual reality. They're educated through the oral tradition. They carry credentials that are recognizable in Aboriginal societies, especially around ethics and community protocols. Next slide. And, and that elders um, are different from experts. So experts um, come in from universities and tell people how to do things. And that doesn't ever go well. Elders live within communities and, and impart their wisdom from a position within the community and participate in this circular knowledge, which is represented by the four directions, which symbolize the emotional, the mental, the spiritual, and the physical. Next slide. So um, I'm, in the interest of time, I'm not going to tell stories about some incredible elders that I know. So next slide. Um, but so mental health has to do with balancing, with balance. In Lakota, it's wichozani. And, and imbalance literally means head on its side, which is tawakapta. So um, there's, this is a metaphor. The medicine wheel is a metaphor for staying in balance. And uh, it means balancing the emotional, the spiritual, the physical, and the community. And all of these are important elements for mental health. Next slide. So in the end, it comes down to the stories that we tell ourselves and that we are told. And it's the stories that teach us how to live. The stories tell us what a good life consists of. The stories tell us what strategies to use to get a good life. The stories tell us how to know if we're happy and how to envision what happiness would be. And um, Leslie Marmoselko wrote that happiness is hard work. You have, you have to work so much harder to be happy than to be miserable, that it, that it takes a lot of effort. And so, um, so this is one of my fa favorite quotes from Leslie Marmoselko, who's a Laguna Pueblo person and, and wrote uh, one of my favorite books of all time, Ceremony. So I know I, I need to stop shortly so that we have time for question and answers, but just a couple more ideas before we stop. So please, next slide. So um, some ideas where indigenous knowledge is intersecting with science. One of these is the idea of speaker-listener neurocoupling or auditory mirror neurons, that um, the same areas of my brain light up when I hear you tell a story as are lit up in your brain when you're telling me a story. The audience effect, that, it, that the physiological effect of hearing a story is much powerful when we're together with other people than when we're alone. That uh, community has an incredible impact upon our healing, that we have big brains so that we can manage our social relationships, and we do that through stories. That um, epigenetics is, is powerful, which is what explains intergenerational trauma and historical trauma being transmitted from ancestors to descendants. And that um, listening to a story entrains our nervous system and, and opens us up 
to transformation and to new learning. Next slide. And so, um, how do we restore balance when we see with two eyes? Well, the indigenous approach would be to say more relational, less procedural. Um, more stories, fewer diagnoses. More bottom up, less top down. More acknowledgement of suffering, more bearing witness to suffering, and less treating symptoms and conditions. Next slide. More qualitative, less randomized controlled trials, more community-based participatory research, less hierarchical imposition by experts, more awareness of the politics of evidence-based medicine, and more appreciation of the Lake Wobegon effect, which is the idea that, um, and we can go on to the end of the slides so that people can see my um, email address again. There we go. The Lake Wobegon effect is the idea that that if you if you use randomized control trials to tell you what to do, that you'll overtreat 80% of the people at, so as to give benefit to 20% of the people. So, um, wow, I've compressed a lot into 20 minutes or so. And um, I hope I've wet, wet your appetite to learn more about two-eyed seeing which you can type into Scholar Google or any other search engine and come up with enormous numbers of papers or visit the, the website at Cape Breton University or talk to me. So the end. <laughs> Thank you, Lewis. That was just amazing. Um, Javid, let's start with you. Do you have any questions for Lewis? Thank yeah. you so much, Lewis, for the gift of your presentation. Uh, it was really, um, validating because I think that uh, there are so many different ways of seeing and knowing um, and the reminder that we co-construct a lot of the knowledge in the world is very needed. One of the challenges I've found in practice is uh, a lot of the evidence that guides mental health treatment uh, actually comes from a very one-eyed paradigm um, that prioritizes biomedical knowledge without appreciating uh, that wellness, well-being is something much more holistic. What advice do you have to uh, people who work in the system uh, to help them be more humble uh, and open to different ways of seeing and knowing uh, evidence as they guide uh, uh, guide themselves through uh, difficulties with their mental health? Well, I'm I'm drawn to uh, two friends of mine wrote a book called Indigenous Mental Health Therapies. Uh, We're a moon Nia Nia and Alistair Bush. And in that book, Alistair, who is a, a psychiatrist, um, described his curiosity at people going to see Wiramu, who was a traditional cultural man, and um, getting better when, when he'd had no success working with them. And so to his credit, Alistair said, well, I'm going to go sit in with him and see what he does instead of dismissing Wiramu as, um, you know, superstitious or you can imagine what people say about traditional, traditional cultural people from mainstream psychiatry. And so Alistair sat and listened and learned and they forged a marvelous partnership between um, psychiatry and Maori cultural healing. And so what I would say is be curious, be polite, listen, listen more than talk. And, and, and that's how wisdom comes. Any other questions, Javid? Yeah, so I also appreciated that you highlighted the importance of different ways of, of approaching inquiry in the field. And we've had several examples of how uh, science and um, other ways of seeing and knowing kind of are complementary rather than distinct from one another. Can you share any examples um, of any treatments that you may be aware of that 
represent a good mix of the two? Well, um, I would say that, um, you know, in, in the, we work with, um, my wife and I work with the tribes of Maine and, um, there are times when, when psychiatric medications are useful and at the same time, getting people embedded in culture, uh, getting them learning their language again, um, getting them to ceremony, connecting them with elders. Um, these are also incredibly useful. And um, so, you know, I would say that, that when we look at, at suffering with two eyes, we're not um, afraid to use the um, medications that um, psychiatry has to offer but we don't believe that that's going to fix everything by itself by any means yes. we're going to 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 go also with the idea that culture is medicine and people need that medicine and that we need to connect them to culture and that maybe someday you know healing will happen and they won't need the psychiatric medication that they'll outgrow it so to speak but, uh, so I think, um, that's, that's two I'd see. I'm not, I'm not, uh, dismissing one or the other. You know, most of my colleagues think the cultural, um, uh, medicine is fluff, has no meaning, no usefulness. Um, but that's, that's really not our perspective. Uh, well, thank you so much, Lewis. You will be joining us again in the panel discussion, as will David. So we'll move on now to our next presentation. And uh, just for that, we have Arden Henley, a gentleman whose organization is doing such amazing things. I had to invite him on today to share how the group Green Technology Education Center plans to rebuild BC following COVID while enhancing workplace mental health. With a doctorate in education leadership from SFU, Arden is a former vice president of City University in Canada and an honorary doctor of traditional Chinese medicine. Well known for his innovative leadership style and thought provoking presentations, Arden consulted broadly with community and government agencies and practiced family therapy and organizational development for more than 40 years. These experiences are outlined in his book entitled Social Architecture, Notes and Essays. And just so you know, Arden participated in a heads up podcast about mobilizing a just and green recovery economy, which will be available on our website early next year. And while we're waiting for Arden to join us, I just wanted to mention that at the Fresh Outlook Foundation, we, we truly believe that in order to address these serious community challenges, we have to involve people from government, business, nonprofit organizations, academia, um, and all other, uh, all other people from all other walks of life. And so I was really interested for Arden to talk about sort of the business link and how um, that is going to be shifting as we move forward. When you think that people spend a good chunk of their time uh, at work and um, if they're, if they are not working in a, in a um, supportive and loving environment, then they're going to take home that, that stress into their families. And then that becomes um, not only a family issue, but a community issue as well as, as that stress sort of spreads exponentially throughout our systems. And so without further ado, I would love to welcome Arden and uh, um, look forward to hearing what you have to say. Good morning, Joe. Uh, thanks for the uh, introduction. Uh, and good morning, uh, all of you who are, who are with us. 
first and foremost, thank you uh, for joining me today and my very best wishes for your continuing safety and good health during these challenging times. Please note also that I'm speaking to you from the unceded lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. We are in a period of rapid transition. Of course, in part because of the incursion of COVID-19, but also because of the growing impacts of the climate crisis. Let me briefly introduce you to the Green Technology uh, Education Center, or GTEC, as we refer to it. GTEC is a BC-based registered nonprofit with CRA charitable status. Our mission is to inform, support, and activate communities in responding to the climate crisis. To our knowledge, we are the only organization in BC exclusively focused on the climate crisis. So there we were in February, delivering a community focused education program called the Neighborhood Environmental Education Project, kindly supported by the Vancouver Foundation and Kitsilano and Collingwood neighborhood houses. NEEP consisted of a series of face-to-face -face mod modules about climate change issues. All of that stopped abruptly in early March and GTEC pivoted to form the Council for a Green New Economy. The Council based its work on two premises. COVID is a precursor of the climate crisis <clears throat> and Economic recovery from COVID should not be predicated on a return to normal because the normal that we were experiencing is actually abnormal because it was based on systematically destroying the planetary environment. GTEC's Council for a Green New Economy authored a well-received report entitled Rebuilding BC that provided a roadmap into a different future, a future that will have profound implications for the sanity of how we work among many other issues. Here's the major recommendations. We recommended uh, accelerating BC's building retrofit programs because of course, in urban environments, particularly buildings are a major source of carbon emissions. We focus very strongly on youth unemployment. It's very clear we're at risk of creating a lost generation of young people because it's so difficult to enter the labor market at the present and also because of issues like a lack of affordable housing for young people. And along with um, road mapping a way to employ youth and working on the climate crisis about which they're very passionate. We also um, emphasize the importance of community economic development. We highlighted, and here we are looking at our third recommendation, the significance of supporting green manufacturing and a move towards a circular economy. We recommended more jobs in the forestry sector while at the same time reducing cut of old growth forests. And to finance all this, we recommended the use of what are called green investment banks in common practice in many European countries at the present. But equally important or more important is what is the kind of world that we're going to create and what is what are the implications for how we work, live, and play together. We envisioned a world with many streets now as community gardens, bike lanes and pedestrian walkways weaving their way through the city. A few automated electric vehicle corridors connecting 
widely separated neighborhoods, an expanded SkyTrain system, food hubs in each neighborhood, packageless stores, and cottage industries dotted throughout an increasingly treed urban landscape. Neighborhood houses and community centers are the focus of reviving community feeling. And there is music, dance, poetry, and visual arts everywhere. This is a socially and environmentally sustainable world. Not enough is said about social sustainability and its relationship with sanity and in turn with how we work. To get a readout on this issue, ask any 11 year old. My granddaughter tells me that what we have done and continue to do to the earth is crazy. It makes her sad and angry as well as frightened about her future, not to speak of never having a family. It looks to her that adults work very hard while all the time allowing the world to be messed up. By the way, as with many children, it is beyond her why we would allow the destruction of so many species of animals. So if we are to be serious about restoring sanity to our workplaces, not to speak of our societies as a whole, here are some critical sanity creating factors. First and foremost, protect the natural world. Restore family and community. Develop local economies, distribute wealth and income equitably, eliminate racism. Let me pause at this point and ask you to reflect on your experience of work during the pandemic. What is most different about your experience of work during this period? I'll return to this during the discussion period and hope that you'll share some of your experience. So the question again, what is most different about your experience of work during this pandemic? Moving on, what are some of the specific implications for the workplace? Well, certainly from a broader perspective, working at home reduces carbon emissions and it also makes more time available for family and friends. And picturing a post-COVID world then, creating a walkable city where people can readily go to and from work, creates more um, sanity in the community and in families, but it also reduces the need and expense of individual vehicles. In turn, Reducing the need for individual vehicles makes space available for green developments such as vertical farming and affordable housing. Going back to the challenges of youth right now, affordable housing is certainly one of the major ones and one of the very great um, difficulties that they're experiencing. And in this kind of situation, then both in work and at home, we create a world in which people are reconnecting with domestic life and with the community around them. To truly address the issue of workplace sanity, we need to recognize the social justice issues involved. This issue is illustrated by the radically different experience of two colleagues of mine. Alan is a corporate lawyer. 
in pre-pandemic days, he commuted every working day from Bowen Island to his downtown office in Vancouver. It was a big deal if he took a day off to work at home. Now he works at home every day. His life, he, he reports, is immeasurably less stressful. He's getting to know his wife and to be a part of his children's everyday life. And he feels he works more efficiently than ever before. He is, he tells me, never going back. Ranbir, on the other hand, is an ICU nurse. COVID has been incredibly stressful for her, not just because of the ever present risk of exposure to the virus, but the pain of supporting people while they suffer and die without family. She's always worried about the stability of daycare for her two young children and the impact of her husband on, of living with someone who is frequently exhausted and often anxious along the road to an enhanced workplace sanity. We have to ask more of Alan and enhance our support of Ranbir. And maybe it's the case we have to ask much more of ourselves as well as much more of Alan and enhance our sensitivity and caring for the people uh, who have what we call these days frontline uh, occupations. Thanks so much for joining me on this journey today. And the part I'm really looking forward to is the opportunity to share some dialogue. Join us now as well. And while we're doing that, I would like to ask you a question submitted by Pierre, who asks, is it guaranteed income, a guaranteed minimum income idea, a positive tool toward lessening the mental health burden? You know, I think there's a lot of merit uh, to that idea. Um, and the uh, complementary idea which we address in Rebuilding C BC is the idea of guaranteed basic services. So everyone under the auspices of guaranteed basic services is entitled to health care, uh, education, affordable housing, etc. So um, it's a different and complementary way about of going about the same uh, goal. So another question that I have is um, about building cultures of compassion within workplaces. And as I mentioned earlier, people, uh, people of working age who are employed spend big chunks of time focusing on their work. How can we build cultures of compassion that will support these people and enable them to uh, do their best work and work that they truly enjoy? Well, that's a great question. Um, and one um, about which I've had some very fortunate experience, Joe. Um, for 22 years, I had the good fortune of creating a master's degree program um, in counseling and after that, a master's degree in education at City University Canada with a group of colleagues. And um, we evolved a set of principles um, that did result in what I would call a culture of compassion. Um, principle among those was um, that each and every person, whether staff, faculty, or student, um, was valued as a person. Um, and rather than as a, a number or a position. Um, as your colleague was 
referring to earlier, we worked very hard to create a culture of listening um, to all the actors involved. So um, when people listen to one another, when they respect one another in fundamental ways, um, a sense of belonging emerges. And I think belonging is the basis of kindness and compassion. When you feel connected and empathetic with other people, kindness and compassion flow quite naturally. Um, I think the other aspect of the environment is virtually all of the leadership in vastly different ways had what you might call their own spiritual site or a location in the society and way of, uh, of um, working on themselves. Um, so uh, those are just some of the features of an environment that I was involved in, fortunate to be involved in, that I think at its best resulted in a culture of compassion. Yes, and we have three uh, event supporters who I think are really working very hard to build those cultures of compassion. Uh, first, Workplace uh, BC, work and WorkSafe BC. We also have the Resilient Mind, which is a an online program for businesses and individuals. Yeah, and also the CLAC union in Canada, which is doing amazing work. And uh, again, we're going to be doing a podcast about that in the new year. So thank you to you, you great supporters. So Javid, um, any questions for Arden? My question is about uh, the pandemic reflection has really highlighted for people about how important well being is versus productivity. I wonder mm -hmm. if uh, he could speak to some of that challenge in that um, culture of, of productivity can erode well-being. How can people balance that at an individual level? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting question, uh, Javid. Um, and part of it, my answer relates to the stories of Alan and uh, Ranbir. Um, what I've seen is an increasing uh, bifurcation of society in relation to work. Um, the people on the front line need a lot more support and um, protection than we're accustomed to providing them. Um, and more privileged people such as myself and other professionals, um, you know, it's actually enabled um, much greater work-life balance. Um, you know, I just before I presented, I. Uh, I'm on my office is right at the back of the house looking at the garden. I stepped away from the computer and did a few exercises. Um, if the day was a little warmer, I would have stepped out into the backyard. And, you know, after I've finished today um, attending the, this very fine conference, I'll join my wife for lunch. That's amazing. Thank you, you know, so much, Arden. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, we, we're going to move on to our next presenter, but we will have questions for Arden during our panel discussion at the end of this session. So look forward to you, uh, Javid, joining us again there as well. Rounding out this session is a woman who truly inspires me. Uh, Sharon Blady, PhD, is a former Manitoba health minister an academic and a comic book geek turned mental health superhero who empowers others with her fandom based Embrace Your Superpowers program. Sharon's multiple diagnoses over a number of years became a source of strength or superpowers that she harnessed and directed for personal, organizational, and community growth. Sharon's life experiences range from being a single mom on social assistance to being responsible for a $6 billion health department budget. She is a survivor of domestic violence, cancer, and suicide, along with being a published author, entrepreneur, and public speaker. Check out our podcast with Sharon in the new year called Brain Tour, in which she and her psychiatrist will compare notes on her fascinating, inspiring, and ongoing journey of healing. 
So thank you so much, Sharon, for joining us. And a, a shout out to uh, Vic Laboutier at The Resilient Mind, who actually introduced me to Sharon. And um, I'm very thankful for that. So take it away, Sharon. Well, first of all, I, I'm really grateful for being here and for Vic's introduction and also um, being following all of these amazing presenters and want to also acknowledge that I am presenting from Winnipeg, which is on the traditional Treaty 1 territory, the lands of the Anishinaabe, Inanu, Oji Cree, Dene, Dakota, and the birthplace of the Métis Nation and the heartland of the Métis homeland. And uh, so that I've also appreciated uh, in my previous background, having come from an Indigenous studies perspective, the fact that you included traditional teaching. And I love the idea of seeing with two eyes. That's something that I used to teach about. So I'm going to come today from the perspective of being a geek girl, what I call the geek girl gospel of mental health. And it comes from a perspective of lived experience, um, of of my own recovery of having been, as you said, the health minister, going through a variety of different things, being a trained peer supporter and a comic book nerd. So what I have found is something that in a way I'm gonna end up touching on a variety of things that other folks have talked about because so often with all of these things, the biggest issue is how is it that we deliver all of these great, wonderful tools? And what I have found is that using things that people are passionate about or connect to and that are part of pop culture become frameworks and filters by which we can then implement these things. So I'm gonna take you from stereotypes to superheroes. Now this is a quote that I love. Um, and was I was in tears in Endgame when uh, when Professor Hulk said this. He said, "For years I've been treating the Hulk like he's some kind of disease, something to get rid of. But then I started looking at him as the cure. And now look at me, best of both worlds. And Professor Hulk is the fusion of Bruce Banner with his alter ego, the Hulk. And that really encapsulates what I'm talking about and the perspective that I have. This is about." talking about the fact that those of us with a diagnosis aren't broken, we are in fact superheroes. So in true superhero form, um, we're gonna talk about mission objectives. So we are gonna start about with reframing to embrace assets and why I call them superpowers. You get some origin stories, the science, the sidekicks, the supervillains, all the good comic book stuff. I'm gonna talk to you about, you know, a snapshot of a few superpowers and how we can reframe those other things that people call a diagnosis and see as a shortcoming or a liability. And I'm also going to talk about how we can empower ourselves and we can educate others. And so that comes from everything like stocking our utility belts and the value of allies and armor to those of us who are superheroes. So there's a snapshot of both sides of my life. My <laughs> My, my role as a government minister and being responsible for a $6 billion budget and the health of 1.3 million people, plus my, my geek girl comic life. So the, in fact, the picture at the top, I find really kind of funny because that's how I was dressed. That was taken the day before I was offered the minister of health job. And that's me dressed as Nick Fury with my buddy Dale as the Wolverine. Picture below is uh, with my kids. So yes, the family that cosplays and geeks together. That's who we are. And then the uh, the final picture is there with as me, Peggy Carter, uh, who you can also see oops, over my shoulder here and uh, with Steve Rogers. So I was uh, the founder of S.H.I.E.L.D. there. So this has informed my life and really the origin of this, having been a geek girl for my whole life, how I came to use the superheroes and the superpowers framework all started with my youngest boy, Heiko. Um, he was the little Ghostbuster you saw before, and there he is as Hans Solo. So yes, we are hardcore, multi-platform uh, geeks, multi-universe geeks. Heiko has got a variety of diagnoses. So my, my kids, like me, share multiple diagnoses. He has, and this at the time, undiagnosed anxiety, ADD, dyslexia, dyscalculia, and dysgraphia. So what that meant was school was absolute torture for him. And as much as I saw certain things and was asking for diagnoses to be done, for testing to be done, it wasn't happening. And so he came to me one day and he basically said, Mom, could you please stop sending me to school? I am broken. I'm a failure. I am never going to get anywhere. So there's no point me going. And he rattled off all of these things that were 
wrong with him. And it had to do with, you know, again, his interactions with others, his sensitivity to certain things and how things were being unfolded, the frustration of how teachers were dealing with him. And what I did was I took each and every one of those things and I reframed it. Oh, so you're telling me that means that you're insightful. So you saw how that was a harmful comment that somebody made and it hurt you or it hurt somebody else's feelings. Oh, you're compassionate. Oh, well, you see things differently. So just because they didn't understand your explanation doesn't mean your explanation doesn't make sense. I said to him, I found myself saying, you're not broken, you're a mutant. You're like an X-Man and you have mutant superpowers. And what I did was I then used the example of Cyclops from the X-Men and Cyclops known for his laser vision. And I said, think about Cyclops. Cyclops's laser vision means that he can zap the bad guys, he can protect his friends, he can fight for good, but it also means if he doesn't put his visor down, guess who's going to set his underwear on fire when he gets ready for school in the morning? So we said, this became our thing. Okay, Cyclops, maybe you need to put your visor down was our little phrase that would get used if we saw that he needed to self-regulate. And we use the language of superpowers and superheroes to take all of these different things that I had learned through cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, mindfulness training, uh, meditation. I mean, those are things that you, you try to talk to an eight-year-old about that, you're going to lose them in a heartbeat. So that's, so I was able to reframe all of these things using parallels and metaphors from the Marvel universe. And that's how this all started was originally to help my son. It's since taken off to something else and the science behind it. I mean, the science that the previous speakers have uh, addressed, that's what I draw from. These are some of what I would call some of the more mainstream books that um, are available to most folks, you know, just at the neighborhood bookstore that have informed this work and that continue to inspire me and in what I do in trying to help others. Because again, this is about us being better understood and about taking these wonderful, useful tools and making them something that, well, frankly, youth will engage with. Because again, as other speakers have said, we need to start, and especially in a prevention model, this isn't even about dealing with someone once they've got a diagnosis. This is about creating dialogue. So I talk to daycares. And I talk to five-year-olds about this stuff and get them to engage in mindfulness and understanding um, how their feelings, how their emotions, how their brains work without using, you know, words like hippocampus or talking about mindfulness. What I tell them is we get them connected with stuff. And the first thing is to start and realize that if you have superpowers, you have these mutant superpowers or what somebody else calls a diagnosis, you have to harness them and that they're inherently neutral and it's what actually is done with them. So this goes to Alex's point before about, you know, the brain is the brain. And, and so it's a case of what is our experience? Now here are two folks. The first one is Magneto on the left. And these two gentlemen are key figures in the X-Men world. Magneto has always experienced persecution. He is a survivor of the Holocaust, and it was during his time in a concentration camp that not only did his powers emerge, but they were used against him. So when you think about somebody who, because of their diagnosis, has experienced stigma, they have experienced marginalization, they have been othered, well, what that does is it feeds fears, insecurities, and you become consumed by anger and defensiveness. And so Magneto, comes to lead a group of folks that they are not evil as mutants, they are the anti-heroes. And they very much represent those of us for whom um, our diagnoses have othered us and have led us to be, again, treated in negative stigmatizing ways. So when you see someone acting out according to their mental health, recognize that they're probably coming from a perspective of having been persecuted. This is where we can harm ourselves and others, and it's what feeds stigma. You think of Magneto's best friend, Charles Xavier, Professor X, well, he came from a different perspective. His superpowers were much more easily hidden and harnessed, and they were never used against him. So he came from a place of privilege where he was able to create an environment of training, supporting, and basically getting young mutants to embrace their superpowers and use them for good, not just for themselves and their own well-being and self-management, but also for that of the world. So that's the perspective that helps end stigma. And what's interesting is that Charles and, and you know, and Magneto or Eric are best friends. 
And Charles never abandons Magneto. He always reaches out to help him heal because he understands that hurt people hurt people. So this, they're a wonderful counterbalance to each other. And one of the things that I always say to folks is what perspective, if you are in a helping role, if you are an educator, if you are a clinician, where are you coming from? You might think you're trying to be Professor X and that should be your goal is to be a Professor X, to be a Professor Hulk. Keep those things in mind because with, as allies, as uh, clinicians, as any of us that support those with lived experience, that's our goal is to be a Professor X or to help people find Professor X. I love the fact that there was a conversation around neuroplasticity or a couple conversations because guess what? Those of us with lived experience, we have. A sidekick. Now these are T'Challa, the Black Panther, and his sister Shuri. Now T'Challa is the hero. He's the superhero. But he can't do, despite all of his powers, he can't do a lot of what he does without the tech that his sister Shuri gives him. So think about that. A brother and sister working in tandem and she is his sidekick. Well what could be closer than that? The fact that our sidekick lives in our own brain. It is neuroplasticity. The fact that we can rewire our brains and that the tools that are there, whether it is through cognitive behavioral therapy, meditation, mindfulness, again, the, the plethora of tools that have been discussed already, um, whether it's through our cultural healing, whether it's through indigenous tools, those all ground us, our stories ground us in our wiring. So we've got our, our sidekick built right in. Now, along with that though, we also happen to have super villains. And interestingly enough, our super villains are stigma and the inner critic. Those are the things we fight. This is what our brain looks like when we're in one of those battles. That's what we fight against is what others do and that othering and the stigma. And then again, when we're talking about those thought processes that we have, that's when the inner critic is when that stigma and when those negative thoughts and that even that default setting to negative that we can have under certain circumstances, that feeds our inner critic. So we've got this interesting balance of where both our sidekick and our supervillains can live side by side and using a superhero model, it's the idea of how is it that we work with our sidekick to then contain our, our super villain. So first of all, I guess I want to say before I, I, I launch into some of the different superpowers that exist, some of, people can share the same diagnosis, but we're all unique. So in other words, right here are three different versions of the Spider-Man model. We have Spider-Gwen, we have Miles Morales, and we have Peter Parker. So just because I share a similar diagnosis or the same again, the same labels as someone else, I am unique. It's not one size fits all. And that's another thing that this kind of a model and a framework affords us. And it's one of the things that I love sharing when I work with doctors and pediatricians as they use this model to uh, work with kids in the early stages of diagnosis and helping support them and their family transition to the life of a superhero. So with that said, okay, we are gonna start with Spidey. Well, Spidey, represents the anxiety anxiety and super our spidey senses those are our superpowers so again we will often think of the negative things associated with the kind of overthinking rumination those types of things tied with anxiety but what that actually gives us is faster threat recognition we are strategic planners because we've got that decision brain you know going in fact i mean as a health minister i can tell you by refocusing my anxiety brain onto systems planning, I was able to troubleshoot and problem solve because my brain and my decision tree thinking that if my anxiety brain in its negative mode could take me from burnt dinner to the apocalypse in 15 steps was also the same brain that could problem solve when a crisis came up and a briefing note came up with a solution and I would be able to say, well, guess what? This is a great start, but it's only gone three or four steps and my brain has taken it an extra few and guess what? The wheels are gonna come off the bus at seven. So let's, let's revise this, let's revamp it, let's take it a few more steps. We have attention to detail, and as much as we might not realize it, and sometimes we beat ourselves up, again, the inner critic tells us that we have you know, poor memory, we're not that smart because certain parts of our brain, the free prefrontal cortex will shut down on us. 
trust me, we've got great memories because we can sit there and overthink that thing that happened six weeks ago where we stumbled on a word in a presentation or something like that. But we do actually have these kinds of traits. We're also known for our resiliency, our empathy and compassion, a self-awareness because of that overthinking. And interestingly enough, we're actually, research has indicated we're better at friendships and considered trustworthy because of these things. Now you'll see some of these things are more about, again, our, our, our what I'll call our natural wiring, the predisposition. Sometimes it also comes from how we have basically had to accommodate. And that's where things like, again, growing self-awareness and a resiliency comes in. So from Spidey, we go to another one of my favorite superheroes, and this is Bucky Barnes. Bucky Barnes is the uh, best friend of Steve Rogers, Captain America. You see him in the first picture uh, as he was heading into World War II. Uh, later, he would be uh, in, the, you see him in the center there as the Winter Soldier when he has been uh, basically brainwashed and triggered by Hydra to be used as an evil agent. And then on the far side, you see him in his recovery as the White Wolf fighting Fighting in Wakanda. He represents the superpowers associated with depression and what happened with him in Hydra is very much like depression where we can be triggered to do certain triggered where we don't feel like ourselves we feel like an alternate entity but the positive things or the assets that can be found in that and a, and a great example of somebody a historical figure with that is actually Winston Churchill it was his grounded realism that after being dismissed as depressive downer you know Winston over there who's getting everybody to worry about um, Adolf Hitler and they're all brushing him off guess who they called in to basically sort out the end of World War II. And it was his grounded realism. It's where if we can refocus our rumination into being deep thinkers. Again, the resiliency, empathy, compassion, and self-awareness. Uh, in fact, one of the lines that my kids use, um, because di uh, depression is one of my diagnoses, is um, they will say, which Bucky am I talking to? Which is actually a line from the movie where Steve is trying to figure out if he's talking to Bucky when he has been triggered and it is this in this alternate, and again, what would parallel a depressive state of the Winter Soldier, or if he is the Bucky that is his childhood friend and most loyal friend. And what that does also is it makes us big picture thinkers. We have connections. We are social justice advocates. Again, foresight, tenacious. My God, if you have survived your own brain, like Bucky and I have, everything is the small stuff so it's that ability to go which which bucky am i today which bucky is my family talking to and that and it creates a language for us because we're one of the things that this model does is it allows you to talk about things that are very personal very um, intense and i think that's where a lot of the quietness or the stigma around this comes from is people are afraid to talk about it you can talk about it using these characters and it creates a safe space. It also gives you a place to relate to characters and the kind of empathy that we show these characters, we can learn to show ourselves and that others can learn to show us. Now, one of the few characters that's actually got a diagnosis in the comic world is Hank Pym, the original Ant-Man, who is bipolar. And the bipolar superpowers include the energy, the optimism, the self-confidence, ambition, and enthusiasm. And Hank has those in spades. He is a phenomenal inventor. He, and so it's the Pym particles that allow him to both shrink, but then also created all of these other characters and allow him to grow to be a giant character as well. And in some respects, that changing of size rec represents the swings that are often identified or that move from bipolar to manic or by the, the mania to the depressive and so he's a, a wonderful metaphor for that and again with the depressive end also comes the skills that we've seen associated with things like depression with the grounded realism the creativity the resilience the empathy and compassion and what's interesting is that some of the very characteristics that made him creative and wonderful were also the things that made it very difficult for him to deal with or have other people deal with him as a superhero. So again, being able to use his story to connect with folks that have that kind of diagnosis or experiencing that can be an empowering thing. And again, going back to that earlier comment that Lewis made about storytelling, it helps us tell ourselves and recreate a whole new story about who we are and an empowering one. And oh my goodness, Tony Stark. 
talk about um, a wonderful character in terms of what we've seen in his story arc in the MCU universe. I use him as an example uh, for um, OCD and OCP, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder or, or personality and those superpowers. And if we go back and we think about Spider-Man, this is part of the reason why Tony ends up sort of taking a parental role and takes Peter under his wings because in many respects, what you can say is this is sort of like anxiety on steroids and he's been through this before and this is why he's such a good mentor. He walks the same path or a similar path and wants to make sure that Peter doesn't make the same mistakes. So again, we have the creativity, the faster threat recognition, the strategic planning. Oh boy, attention to detail. Did you see that picture? Those were the you know, handful of the 45 different versions of his suit that he has made. Better memory, talk about a problem solver and proficiency. Again, those suits, the suits that he has made for everyone from Falcon to Spider-Man, he's done all of these different things. And what happens is with that proficiency, you learn, you can learn anything and you can learn that anything is possible. And what Tony also represents, because it's not always seen initially, but he shows the growth that when supported, we can become sensitive to other people's needs. A lot of times people see folks who have these diagnoses as being rigid and, and, and not understanding other people's perspectives. Tony provides a wonderful arc of support that actually means that he gets to a place where he is able to, with that sensitivity to other people's needs and that support and being part of a team, becomes phenomenal at integrating instead of bust you know bumping up against their ideas integrating their ideas into what he's already got going so that's another set of superpowers as somebody that lives with um, ptsd wolverine is probably one of the first characters that i ever bonded with and long before i understood how my diagnosis and I mean, as a child, this is my, my, my diagnosis goes back to my childhood as does my love of Wolverine. So he is again, representative of the superpowers of the, the wounded healer. We have when we are supported and can process our healing, because really what trauma is, is unhealed an unhealed experiment is our experience, horrific experience. If we haven't had opportunity to heal from it, we develop trauma and then that trauma needs to be healed. So we develop resilience, empathy, compassion, self-awareness, again, grounded realism, and we can become open and flexible. And it might seem like a, a bit of a, an odd thing to say, but in the end, we end up with hope and optimism appreciated for, you know, we have, we have appreciation for others and we rebuild to be better. It's one of the reasons why Wolverine and many of us with PTSD, especially when you see it in uh, frontline workers um, and other folks that have gone through anything from surviving war, surviving domestic violence, surviving abusive childhood. A lot of times we end up being the wounded healer that goes in and puts ourselves on the front line. Um, because we don't want somebody else to go through what we've gone through. And that's part of our post-traumatic growth. And so that's one of, again, those are superpowers. The one thing I want to say too, is that the reason why I use Wolverine is that he provides two different le additional lessons for us. First of all, he is the king of the crappy days. So those of us with lived experience, we have crappy days. But you know what? When Wolverine has a crappy day, he's no less Wolverine. He is no less a superhero. So if Wolverine is still a superhero on his lousiest days, you know what? When I'm having a lousy day, I can remind myself of that. I can show myself self-compassion based on the idea that I know just because my diagnosis is acting up today, my inner critic is, is getting getting in there and wheedling in, I can go, hold on, I am no less because Wolverine is no less. The other thing is too, is that for those of us with lived experience and especially something related to trauma, think back to the very first X-Men movie where he's in the truck with Rogue and she has just seen him fight and just seen his claws come out. And she asks him, does it hurt? And he says, every time. So he chooses to use his powers, even though it causes him pain, knowing that it's for the greater good. And that is one of the things that often, often happens with us as wounded healers. And it's the path that we walk to ensure that when we do things, whether it's sharing our stories, whether it's supporting others and peer support, that 
we are mindful of our own healing in supporting others, but to know that sometimes, again, it can hurt every time. Um, now I'm going to more into neurodiversity because I don't just work in mental health, I also work in neurodiversity. And um, as was mentioned earlier by Janine, again, a lot of us who have neurodiversity also have lived experience of mental health. I dare you to find a kid with an anxiety or a dyslexia diagnosis or another neurodiversity diagnosis that has not experienced some kind of, again, trauma or mental health uh, uh, experience along the way. So with this, we have Nightcrawler. And Nightcrawler's superpower is his ability to teleport. Um, so I use him as uh, a representative of ADD, ADHD superpowers. Please, as somebody with ADHD, do not tell me that I cannot focus. I have the superpowers of divergent focus. So I can be energetic, spontaneous, creative, and by gosh, when you engage me, I can become hyper-focused. And so the issue with, with those of us with what is you know considered a, a deficiency in our ability to focus is really a problem of the larger system to engage us. Um, when kids with learning disabilities and mental health diagnoses are failed by the system, it's the system failing them. It's not an us problem, it's the broader society not meeting our needs. And you know what, when you meet our needs, you meet everybody's needs. Right now, the system is so much designed on the folks in the middle of the spectrum, the neurotypical. Well, what happens is we get left on the edges. When you look after us, you end up by default covering the entire spectrum. So one of the things about being um, neurodiverse and having ADHD is we like, like Nightcrawler who pops around to different places, we see things from multiple perspectives. That is a phenomenal skill from a diplomatic perspective. It helps us problem solve because we see and connect dots that sometimes other people don't even know exist. I know my own master's thesis, we had to bring two in, bring in two other um, experts because I had started connecting dots that my committee didn't understand. Um, and again, it gives us generosity, resilience, and a sense of fairness because again, we can see things from multiple perspectives. But the thing is, is superheroes are always stronger with allies. So here is one of my favorites, Nick Fury. And the reason why I show him is that as a mom with neurodiverse kids and as somebody that's had to advocate, sometimes you do really want to bring your best Samuel L. Jackson to the party <laughs> to do that advocacy work. Advocate to create neurodiverse and mentally healthy environments. That starts with non-judgment. We don't choose these powers or our bad days. That starts with acceptance. It meet us where we are, and that's where we are today in our journey, where we are in the overarching aspect of our journey. Meet us where we are, nothing about us without us and engagement, as I said before. What works for us makes for a stronger and healthy and healthier environment for all. And this is where I love working with teachers, with doctors, with frontline nurses, with folks that engage with us and see how they can take all of their wonderful professional training and harness it in a way and deliver it in a way to truly support us as allies. The other part of that is the armor. And that's about tools. And when, again, we've talked, uh, plenty of folks today have already talked about tools. We need to learn them and we need to learn them early and we need to encourage preemptive use. Every child needs to learn mindfulness and belly breathing and all of these different things because that can help alleviate things. That can do the positive neuroplastic wiring earlier on. Um, so it's about tools and activities. It's also about understanding that in terms of our tool belts, stocking our utility belts, learn as many different things as possible. Cognitive behavioral therapy was a wonderful tool for, for me, but I don't sit there and say that it's the only tool because I know that maybe one day for me, it might not be the tool. So it's stop, help us stock our utility belts, have a range of tools. The more tools a superhero has in their utility belt, the better prepared they are. And again, encourage preemptive use, not just use in panic, because again, that's what's going to build up the neural pathways that will make those tools more effective when we are going into battle with our inner critic. Again, value and utilize superpowers. So again, in terms of the workplace, 
play to our strengths. Don't sit there and worry about an employee that's got an anxiety disorder and how many days off he might have to take. Go, oh my God, work with him. Find out maybe he's got that same strategic planning brain as I do. Get, Re rework his assignments and his his job description so that he can be your strategic thinker play to our strengths and help us stretch to grow and always try to integrate and again whether this is in the school environment the work environment peer support we need others who have our experiences we need to talk and it doesn't mean sharing a diagnosis it just means somebody else with lived experience because we end up as superheroes literally having a shorthand. Things that we have to try to explain to those without lived experience or the neurologically normal can be challenging uh, for other folks, but they can be easy conversations for us. And again, educate everyone in the environment and know that allies make a difference. So please work with those that you know and love and with yourself to find your, embrace your superpowers and find your inner superhero. And thank you so much for your time today. Share. It is just really exciting to to hear about what you're what you're doing. So now we'd like to move into the panel discussion portion of this session. That's so, uh, my apologies, Joe. <laughs> oh, not a problem. No, not a problem. And uh, we'll be bringing those speakers in, sort of, um, as they they are available to come online. Um, Javid, maybe can you start with a question for Sharon, if you have one? Thank you so much, Sharon. So I, yeah. I actually think uh, your approach resonates with me. I frequently, with my practice, use superhero analogies. In fact, I use the term super feelers a lot huh? for kids who experience intense emotions and yeah. describe how with great power comes great responsibility. Responsibility, Stanley. Yep. <laughs> yeah. so I appreciate that. But actually, my question uh, is a bit unrelated to that. I uh, really appreciate that you've straddled in terms of having lived and living experience, but also being in the position of being a decision maker in government. And I think that uh, a lot of us that work within organizations uh, experience inequities in terms of the ways that people with uh, mental illness and addiction are treated compared to physical illness. And we see those inequities uh, structurally as well in terms of how systems are designed and funded. So I'd love to hear a bit more of what it's like to be an insider um, and, and how one reconciles sometimes that distress of working within a system to change that system uh, in the shadows when people from the outside don't really know what's going on. Well, for me, that's part of the reason why it was truly an honor to be the Minister of Healthy Living and the Minister of Health, both health, uh, both portfolios that touched on mental health. I became the Minister of Healthy Living about three months after my last suicide attempt, uh, something that folks didn't know. And so for me, it was about being that insider and advocating for change. And it was later as Minister of Healthy Living, uh, or Minister of Health, that I went public with my mental health because I found it frustrating. I cannot tell you the number of times that I sat in meetings with, you know, departmental and other professionals and clinical professionals and talking about something and they would be presenting and be like, I get what you think you're doing, but I can tell you as the person that's walked into an eMERGE in that thing, how you're delivering that, you're delivering that as if I am walking in mentally healthy. What you said there and how you're delivering that does not register with my depressive or my suicidal brain. It does not register with me as somebody with, uh, you know, going through a panic attack. So a lot of it is we, we, first of all, we need to have more conversations so that there are more of us out there and that we're not seen as exceptional. Like this is not about, oh my God, you know, I, 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 this way, I don't think I was the first uh, minister of health that had a mental health diagnosis. I was just the first one that was open and honest about it and was willing to use it as a decision maker to change things. And that we do have to put more money in prevention. And I fought tooth and nail to get different things in there. And one of those things is trying to convince folks, especially when you, I mean, I was responsible for $6 billion. <laughs> Holy. Um, trying to explain that right now we are paying this kind of money and our care costs are going up. Whereas what we need to do is invest a more in prevention than what we're currently doing. And what you're actually going to do is you in the long run will bend the cost curve. But right now you're going to double up 
and the more we do in prevention, the return on investment on prevention usually is in a one to seven to one to 10 and can even go up to a one to 20. So it's getting decision makers to be on board and to not be, um, I guess you say cautious or frankly, a lot of times it's about the squeaky wheel gets the oil. So they're juggling a bunch of priorities. So for me, it was about how much can I change things? I purposely knowing that I had a short period of time seeing the way the political cycle was purposely created a minister's advisory group and embedded it within a regional health authority, knowing that if I didn't survive the next election, it was now a non-political force that would hopefully have a longer shelf life than me to get some work done. So we definitely have to keep advocating. That's one of that's what I'm trying to do as well, is take this position that I have and educate people on the ground about how to incorporate things as a parent, as somebody with lived experience, but then also how to empower folks to make change with government because government does need to do more prevent it has to be about prevention it has to be we need to change the education system so that nobody comes out of a university with an education degree that has not got at least one course under their belt on mental health and neurodiversity because it was teachers that didn't understand my son that were preventing him from getting a proper diagnosis so we have to change the education system and we have to have professional development days that and we also have to again get, get get clinicians on board that again i'm thankful for all the folks that i worked with but there are a lot of really well-meaning folks that don't realize that in their practice they're still treating me like i'm broken and i'm not broken stop trying to you know this is like this is not even about square pegs and round holes this is about a sparkly sp star-shaped pain that you're trying to stick into a round hole. And I won't do that. <laughs> oh, thank you, Sharon. I, I'd like to trigger a discussion about the cultures of compassion. I hear that term everywhere I go, and it it, uh, it seems to me to be a, um, a, a hugely beneficial goal. So I'd love to, to ask each of you, but let's start with Vanessa. Within the mental health care community, you as a psychologist and educator and, and consultant and whatever, how can you help build cultures of compassion within that community specifically and within uh, communities more generally? Yeah, so I've been the majority of my time now in uh, an educational kind of role, although I do still find myself sitting in my counseling chair uh, a few hours a week. And from that educational platform, my goal has always been to really walk us away from what I will call a behaviorist perspective in terms of understanding children and walk us into the lived experience of the individual child. And to that end, I've developed this three-part um, mantra, which goes like this. You've got to see it, then you've got to feel it, and then you've got to be it. And the see it is the easy part. Oh, well, this kid's, you know, um, not able to sustain focused attention and engage with in-seat activities. Um, I don't like that behavior. I'm going to now implement some kind of a consequence uh, or something related to that in order to squash the behavior, which is where uh, the dominant pop culture is at right now still in terms of understanding who children are. We don't like the behavior, we squash it. And the behavior, uh, what we know from child development and the science around all that, the behavior is just the facade. And so we have to go beyond seeing and we have to go into feeling. If you can climb behind the facade of that behavioral crust, then you are going to strike gold. Because when you can look out at the world through the eyes of that child and you can eat and sleep and breathe and feel and live what it is that they are living, I promise you, 99% of the time, okay, 100 million percent of the time, that you will be, you will actually be brought to your knees. And the very last thing that you would ever dream to do would be to penalize that child for the way that they have shown up um, in this world. You would want to do everything in your power now to come alongside who it is that they are so that they never experience shame for that um, uh, embodiment of themselves. 
and that they get to be superheroes, that they get to recognize, you know, the uh, inherent strengths that they've brought in with them. And that we, you know, when there's something, uh, if a plant is struggling, we don't like go in and yard on the plant to make it grow better and faster. We retreat to the environment and we look around and consider what is it that we must change in the environment. That's where the compassion comes in. And in my clinic, we have about 150 kids coming through our doors every week. None of them come in with what I call layer one, like a, a, a simple layer one. Oh, I have a learning difference. Oh, I have this, I have that. They all come in with layer one and layer two. And layer two is the trauma that they experience when they have to walk around every day in a world that does not understand them. So to inspire this culture of compassion, we see it, then we feel it. And from the place of feeling it, we will be for children what it is that they need for us to be. And that really could extend to the entire population. Wayne Dyer famously said, we are not human doings. We are human beings, so it's upon us to step up and be. And from the being, when you change the internal experience and can land on compassion for children, when that becomes your being, the doing flows from the being. And if we could ripple that out through our culture, change the world. Amazing. Thank you, Vanessa. Andy, talking about technology, certainly, um, and for those of us who are technophobic, uh, technology seems sort of the, the opposite of connection and compassion. So how can you use what you're learning in your research and throughout your networks around the world? How can you use all that and use the technology to help build those cultures of compassion? Well, I think it's really important to realize that technology has to be in the service of people, not utilitarian functions. So when we talk about predictive analytics, for example, we're trying to look for what will help people, right? What's good for people, different folk, strokes for different folks, as I said, but I'm gonna be a meanie. I'm gonna bring out the dark side. Sharon touched on it a little bit, but it's, there, there are some exceptions. Uh, a book I really like that's very accessible is a book called The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog by Bruce Perry. And Bruce is a pediatrician with interest in psychiatry, Wonderful man, if you ever get to hear him, those of you in the audience, um, go say hi. He's, he's a friend and colleague and really headed for the right space. Bruce's book would inform you that when a child does not have that early building block of compassion, you can generate a human being that is somebody with something missing. And we still haven't found out how to bring those people back. So Bruce would tell you in his book, and it's been affirmed by others, and we talked about um, you know, generations of trauma and the need to support people and the need to, to lift people up. Um, if you don't have that piece, then you end up with a different kind of person without compassion. And there are examples of what we call in the, in the lay literature, successful psychopaths. Now, you all probably think of one person around this Thanksgiving <laughs> on the world leadership scale who, who kind of is in that box, according <laughs> to some people. But, um, you know, when you're going out there and we're talking about supporting people and we're talking about whether we're talking about technological engagement or whatever, being able to predict how much you can help, how much you can bring somebody back. Because if you happen upon one of those cases, can it can be very damaging. There are some very few cases that cannot be rescued. And this is the realm of forensic psychiatry. Um, I, I live with forensic psychiatry because my wife is a forensic psychiatrist and I get all of the good and bad stories every day when she comes <laughs> home. Um, but coming back to technology and prediction, looking at all of the people and all of the pieces, and I'm mindful of Lewis's um, talk when he's talking about you know, the limits of positivism and reductionism. When you look at all the data, it's really multi-eyed seeing. And from that perspective, we can try and find out ways to really support people. So technology and the service of people, 
using these very powerful anal analytical tools, whether it's you know Alex playing with neuroimaging or us playing with big data sets with um, health data or people's narratives and stories, people are mining the internet for comments and trying to help people with suicidal thoughts and so on. Technology is in the right place, not barren, it's not arid. And um, I know Joe and I talked about the real, the real goal for artificial intelligence and machine consciousness. That's for another time, but um, really building on that complexity and getting technology to help what we put in determines what we get out. And if we program in the need for compassion and support and understanding, we are on the right track. There's a whole lot of interest in ethics, diversity, and inclusivity in AI right now. It's a very hot topic around privacy and safety and stuff. Great. So I hope that informs it a little bit, but yeah. that Ruth Perry book is, is a wonderful story about possibility for recovery when someone has an early at least one positive relationship but if there are none you have a different being the programming is very different thank you thank you Andy. um my my next question is for alex um alex you work in an academic environment and so you're certainly familiar with the um the workplace implications of of a culture of compassion but also, um, harken back to your presentation about self-awareness and self-help um, techniques. Um, how do those two link together? It would seem to me that the beginning of a cultural uh, a culture of compassion is individual compassion or self-compassion. Yeah, um, I agree that it's it's very hard. Uh, if not impossible to have compassion towards others or to express that compassion towards others unless you um, uh, treat yourself with that sense of compassion. And that's where the neuroscience can be uh, sort of like a double-edged sword in that, um, like, I... I like to tell people about like the the biological basis of uh, anxiety and depression as a way to reduce stigma, uh, self stigma, and to help them increase self compassion. Because I want to be like, look, like it's not, there's nothing wrong with you. It's not your fault. Like this is just the way that the human brain evolved. Like we have circuits that are responsible for anxiety. Like that's their job. And they, they as Sir Sharon said, like these are superpowers. Uh, like we need those circuits. It's just mm -hmm. that in some people, uh, you know, and worrying, worrying is good too. Worrying is thinking yeah. deeply about all the things that might go wrong in the future. Uh, like, you know, how can you play chess by, you know, you think several moves ahead and you're like, oh, nope can't do this because then they would move here and then like that's worrying that's that's a uh, a real good feature of the prefrontal cortex which is the sort of most advanced part of the brain uh the problem arises from the interaction of those like oh if you're kind of a worrier nothing wrong with that on its own but like you also have anxiety and then also you have these other uncontrollable things in your life that are outside of your control then all of those things conspire and maybe you get stuck in uh anxiety uh but there's not like something wrong with you and so you should treat yourself with compassion mm -hmm. now the like the other side of the neuroscience is like well just because there's some things that you can't control and can't do like there are some things that you can do you can exercise more you can change your sleep patterns you can um have more, you know, social interactions, like these little things that uh, change your brain activity and chemistry. Uh, now, when people focus on that part, sometimes that can almost unfortunately like decrease compassion because they're like, ah, oh, well, you know, yeah, I just need to, you know, sleep better and I just need to do this and I have to do that. And they're, they're just criticizing themselves and bludgeoning them over themselves over the head. They're like, I should be able to do everything in your book 
you know, oh, there's so many aspects of the upward spiral. I need to do this and this and this and this and this. And therefore, it's my fault if I'm still anxious or if I'm still depressed. And like, it's a, it's a sort of a, a, narrow, a, a middle path where people have to understand that like, yes, there are some things that you can't control and are not your fault. And like the only good, helpful approach forward is to treat yourself with compassion and to have acceptance for those. And then there's this other set of things that like you do have control over and you have some control over, but we can't like scientific studies can tell you on average that, you know, practicing gratitude will have this size effect but it can't necessarily tell you for you specifically, given all your uniqueness, what the exact effect will be in this specific moment in time. So science can give you sort of the, a set of options to choose from that are likely to work, um, but unless you know Andy's work progresses a lot farther, we can't currently say like, oh no, you definitely at, you know, right now, this moment in time, you should practice gratitude uh, or you should practice mindfulness. So you just have to, try these things and they will have some effect. Um, and so that's why it's complicated because the line between like what you can control and what you can't control and some one at the far ends is like very clear, but sort of as it gets to the middle, it's not clear until you try, like I'm feeling really down and depressed today is that something that I should just say, oh, well, I guess that's just how I'm feeling today. Or should I call up a friend or go for a run? Well, in any specific instance, we can't necessarily know, but we know that you should be able to, at some point to do both of those things. Uh, and so if you can't find the balance, then you're, you're probably either going to be giving up too much or you're going to be criticizing yourself. And if you can find that balance in the middle, then you can have some self-compassion and realize that, yes, even though I understand things that are helpful for me and I have some control, I don't have full control and I need to um, be able to be compassionate and that I can uh, direct that same attitude towards others. Thanks, Alex. Um... So Sharon, regarding cultural, uh, a culture of compassion, I've been working for 30 years with local governments um, to help them in their outreach and, and engagement processes around community sustainability issues. And I've, I've learned that many people think that it's government's job to fix all of our societal challenges and, and um, with my experience, I believe that that is not only unrealistic, but it's unfair because we need a balance of, of uh, insights and ideas and, and uh, passions from all different sectors. Mm -hmm. But given your experience at the provincial level of government, um, what do you think government's role is in, in building this culture of compassion beyond policy changes such as things like living wages, for example, and complete access to care? Well, I think we have to start with the social determinants of health, which uh, again, and that does involve things like, you know, proper financial supports. Somebody, you know, somebody cannot work on mindfulness um, if they are worried about paying their rent and feeding their children. Uh, just plain and simple. That's, uh, you know, you suggest that to them, or if you just did this, or if you just did that, you'd feel better. And you're like, well, I'm kind of worried about whether I'm going to have a place to live at the end of the month. So government needs to take a compassionate view. And then I think this is the other part too. And we live in a very polarized world in terms of supports and taxations and things like that, and people's perspectives on them. Taxes are a price we pay for a civilized society. And then those monies that we pay into that collectively, it's for the benefit of all if it's invested properly. So it is about ensuring that everybody has a roof over their head, food in their belly, and, and empower people to do those things. So in other words, it's not about a handout, it's about a hand up, and it's about teaching things. So when I was in government, one of the things that we introduced was the PACS Good Behavior Game. 
And we purposely introduced that into places where kids had, again, in terms of the social determinants of health, in terms of um, maybe the, the, the socioeconomic position that they were in, um, by investing in them and starting at that kindergarten grade one level, again, the return on investment by doing something in the classroom, first of all, it increased self-awareness, it increased compassion and empathy for themselves and others, and ultimately resulted in higher achievements in school, less involvement with the, um, with the justice or child and family services systems. And so what happens is it's, it is about working with, so government has a role, but the thing is, is that government tends to do what people want. So if people say, we don't wanna pay taxes, well then guess what? then we don't have funding for those things. So people have to, I spend a lot of my time explaining to folks, I represented the suburban neighborhood that I was born and raised in, how their tax money going into this particular neighborhood that was filled with higher risk kids who needed more supports than their kids did was actually a benefit to their neighborhood and the benefit to us collectively and that it brought down other kinds of things. But unfortunately, it's not simple. It, there's not a, there, there isn't a, a magic bullet, but it's about compassion, across the board and we need to elect compassionate officials. We need to uh, elect authentic folks. And sometimes sadly, the way the system is set up, it is set up that compassionate, empathetic folks go, why in God's name would I wanna get involved in this mess? Why would I wanna <laughs> live under that scrutiny? So part of it is we as citizens have to create an environment where we don't watch the stupid news that tells us fake things and insights, whatever. So it's, it's about us. It's literally voting, voting with our dollars, voting with um, electing compassionate people. And you know what? Sometimes the most compassionate people are not the sexy soundbite people that, again, are going to get the screen time. So we also have to change our expectations. Guess what? The good people are sometimes going to be a little booky. They might be policy wonks, but you know what? They're going to get the job done right and they've got their heart in the right place. So we've also got to give up the shiny glossy image and and hold elected officials to a different d develop a different standard because we want to get people in there that make those choices and that are willing to say yes I'm willing to bend that cost curve and to lead by example because again we need to be able to show compassion and I think it's it's interesting the conversations around compassion and self-compassion that my my goal is always to help people empower themselves, gain greater self-awareness, greater self-compassion, and as a result, greater self-management and self-expression with their superpowers. Oh, thank you, Sharon. So Javid, how would you like to pick these amazing brains? I wish we had more time to do so, but I think um, one of the things I wanted to ask about was courage. You've talked about compassion, community, connection. We are existing in spaces where um, thinking about mental health is not the norm. Our healthcare system in particular prioritizes physical health and there's a lot of discrimination and prejudice towards people. We call it stigma, but really it's discrimination and prejudice. Yet, the people who break their silence and have the courage to speak up about this uh, are, are often punished for doing so. Uh, particularly in a Canadian context, I've lived and worked in the U.S. as well. But in Canada, you know, we're very polite. Uh, we can at times be passive aggressive as well. And so people who are silence breakers or whistleblowers uh, aren't often um, revered in our culture. So how can we foster brave spaces uh, in our organizations and in our communities where people are willing to have tough, difficult conversations? when we know that, that that kind of courage is what we need to move forward uh, when it comes to these issues. Vanessa, can you give us a, a leg up on that? You know, as soon as you asked the question, I was reminded of a six-year-old little girl that I worked with several years ago. And I asked her the question, what is courage? And in her infinite wisdom at age six, she responded to me and said, Courage is you are afraid, but you do it anyway. And in thinking through your question, I think about what creates that kind of space for somebody to be able to be afraid and do it anyway, to have those two simultaneous um, giant things occurring at the same time. And the safety in that space comes from relationship. 
it always comes back down to connection. So how is it that we can foster understanding? How is it that we can foster connection and relationship so that we create a space, an invitation, an opening that people can step in and be afraid, but do it anyway? And I think it's the collective unity of voices such as the people who are on this um, panel right now and others who are already kind of stepping up and starting to sort of uh, talk very openly about, um, you know, what it is that is required. Um, and the more we can have our voices be floating around in the world, um, the more we let others know we see you and we hear you and being seen and heard is the pathway into uh, feeling connected and being in relationship. And so I think, you know, um, how we do that, well, that's a great question. Um, and that's the atmosphere that we need to be um, creating. Andy. Such a fantastic conversation. I'm reminded of um, work of something called the Palex Foundation that's here in Alberta. We've been working a lot with Jack Shonkoff, who directs the Center for the Developing Child in, in Harvard. And they took a bunch of tough kids, teenagers, in a tough school in a big city in the US, and they explained to them what they call the brain story, which is really about epigenetics, adverse early childhood experience, inheriting the, the, the trauma of your parents. And these I would call them kids, but respectfully, they felt that they were lost. They felt that they were broken because they'd been told they were broken. And when somebody took them to one side, it, I mean, it, it resonates with your superhero story, Sharon. Absolutely. I love that presentation. They, they learned, well, we didn't do this. This happened to us when we're growing up. But they also told them about neuroplasticity and how with affirmation and understanding and kind of enabling them to have courage that they would be okay. And these kids rose up as examples of people who really wanted to make a difference in their local community. And we see these icons of people who grew up in great adversity somehow being enabled to have courage. Like they're afraid, they're intimidated, but they, they kind of by the story it's like no this i'm okay this is you know the superhero thing this happened to me i know this this isn't knowledge i give to anybody but i can use this it's powerful and i think that's what resonates for me examples like that and we talk about the big things Javid. i mean the, the big institutional things are a problem but i've believed since i was quite young that local action is probably really important you know, you go and wave a big flag. If you're a minister in a provincial government, you have more power and influence and a bigger voice. But all of us making that difference locally can have the courage to introduce something or say no to some prejudice. And prejudice is typically based on ignorance and selfishness is based on ignorance. I always tell people, the more you give, the more you receive. And I really believe that, right? Um, the more positive you're seen to be, the more people want to interact with you and the more they support you. So it's a virtuous, positive cycle. Alex, your thoughts on courage? When you first mentioned the, the topic of courage, I was originally sort of thinking about like just on an individual level that like when I talk a lot about, um, you know, these different elements of the upward spiral, people think that, oh, just like reading it and understanding it, that that's somehow like, makes it really easy and I have to be like, no, like <laughs> you're going to still have a lot of this anxiety and like, you're just going to have to have the courage to just like face it. Like, and hopefully understanding a little bit about the neuroscience and knowing like, oh, like it feels like there's something terribly wrong. Oh, but that's just, that's just my overactivity of that brain circuit. So like, hopefully it will help you to give you a, a little bit of courage uh, to act. Mm -hmm. um, but I think um, Javid's question is really interesting. Also just about, you know, the broader, how can we create spaces for people to be courageous? And 
I thought it was, uh, uh, you know, sort of highlights the impact of culture uh, as like one of those uncontrollable things that we are sort of immersed in, but that have an effect on our, you know, brain activity and chemistry. And uh, this notion of like, you know, you just got Canadians as, you know, being polite and nice. And I think that's, you know, my being from America, that's my experience uh, as well. And that has a lot of advantages, uh, you know, greater social harmony and, you know, just easier interactions. Uh, but there can be problems with like, oh, being polite, because it sort of means that there's less space or acceptance of like making people feel uncomfortable. Like, uh, I think in the U S there's more acceptance of like, yeah, it's fine. You can make people feel uncomfortable. That's their problem. Uh, but in other politer cultures, like there's a much higher social emphasis placed on like, no, you shouldn't make other people feel uncomfortable. Uh, well, what if you're suffering from some, you know, terrible mental uh, disorder and like the things that you need to share or whatever are going to make people feel uncomfortable? Like, well, are other people going to blame you for like breaking out of your expected social role? And I think uh, um, the ideal way forward is for people to realize like, Yes, it's like good to be, you know, polite and not try to make people uncomfortable, you know, intentionally, but just also recognize the limits of that and realize like, oh, well, when someone is uh, is talking about their mental health challenges, that makes me feel uncomfortable. Am I then having an automatic judgmental criticism? Oh, they should they shouldn't be doing that. And it sort of starts with people realizing like that you shouldn't, you shouldn't judge people for making like, it basically it's not the worst thing to sometimes make people feel uncomfortable. Uh, and that hopefully can encourage people. And Sharon, courage. Courage. Well, hold on. Courage is it. Again, I go back to the superhero thing and it, and it, and it's the, you know, the comments made before about the idea that, you know, the idea of doing something that might scare you, might make you afraid, but you still do it anyways. Again, Wolverine and that reference there, there's Wolverine up behind me there, how it hurts every time it's that's where, and again, and this goes to this idea of courage, courage is about having that ability to go forward, but also knowing that you are doing it in within, within community. And so this is where I talk about allies and why superheroes need teams and all of these kinds of things, because courage comes from knowing that if you fall, you have folks around you that can help you pick yourself up and dust yourself off. I mean, a superhero always knows that it's not about how many times you fall. It's about how many times you get up. And, and then when we think about those ideas too, around what it means to, um, you know, make people uncomfortable as an educator, one of the first things that I told my students is we tend to learn best from uncomfortable spaces. And, and that, and I, and I mean, and I am a non-Indigenous instructor that had to, my very first class to teaching here in Manitoba after moving back um, from doing my PhD work was I had to teach um, social work students, 36 Indigenous social work students, I had to teach them the intro uh, Indigenous studies program through the U of M as part. So we just started off with what's the white chick from the burbs doing here teaching this to you? And this is going to be uncomfortable for all of us. And you have every right to call me out, do whatever, see me suspiciously as potentially. And it was about we are going to learn from uncomfortable spaces. And I think that's the thing is, as mentioned before, sometimes in a polite culture, I mean, yes, you can, you can, you can make people uncomfortable without being offensive gruff this is this is that thing about civility can be uncomfortable you can be civil and you can engage in civil discourse um and still make people uncomfortable and that's where they're going to move because it this is where we do see again we call it stigma but it is discrimination it is human rights violations i mean the number of times that I hate to say this, and this is where I went, you know, when I put on the Samuel L. Jackson stuff, when my kid with his learning disability said, would excuse me, but right now my son is in the equivalent space to a child in a wheelchair that can't get into the school because there's only stairs and a ramp. 
Yes. So, um, but this is, but because he's not in a wheelchair, it's the fact that he's dyslexic and you've just put him in an entirely text-based course. That's just as much of a human rights violation. Well, again, <laughs> civil discourse, being polite, by God made them uncomfortable, but the lights went on and the job got done. And so that's one of the things I think we need to learn. And that's for those of us. And again, and the other part too, is that in terms of folks coming forward, I know that telling your story of lived experience is not everybody's thing. I do not encourage everybody that's got a story to share it unless they are comfortable with it because it can be re-traumatizing. So it's about those of us that um, are comfortable with it. And I even know that, I mean, my sharing of my story is always curated and it is curated for my mental health because I know as a trauma survivor, what I can share, what I do share, doesn't make me any less authentic, but my boundaries and my healing matter first. And if I'm going to lead by example and share my story, that's how I lead by example. So that's the other part too. Everybody with a story doesn't have to share it because that could do more harm than good for them. And that's the other part, creating a space for people to yes. be either courageous in their authenticity and keeping it to themselves because that's their healing, or courageous in going forward and doing whatever it is that works for them. So again, every superhero is different. Yes, thank you. And and uh, we should be wrapping up, but I'd like to extend this conversation for just a few more minutes. Um, Javid, great question about courage. And if, if any of you have been following Brené Brown's work, you'll know that uh, you have courage on the one hand and vulnerability on the other. And when you, when you bring them together, um, that is when some of the magic happens. Mm -hmm. And uh, just saying that I really appreciate what Sharon said about vulnerability being, being a personal choice. I also know that it, in the case of Janine's story this morning and Sharon's story um, later on, that vulnerability is what enables us to see into a, a through a lens that we wouldn't otherwise be able to envision. And a perfect example for me is when I was talking with people starting a few years ago about this summit, I would I talk about the specifics and the logistics and they would nod and, and uh, hum and haw. But when I started talking about my own history, with anxiety, depression, and disordered eating, um, and how that had affected me and how I wanted to use that to, to build dialogue, I could see them physically moving in toward me and uh, just moving the, the angle of their head. They were truly listening to what I had to say. And so I would um, like each of you just to end off with a comment about vulnerability and whether or not it works for you and how you see it uh, playing into the evolution that we're moving toward uh, better mental health. So Vanessa, starting with you. For me, vulnerability is really about being able to speak truth with power and grace from an authentically resonant space and to not feel like we need to edit or, or um, switch it up uh, to appease anyone around us, but that we just step forward into um, the light of who it is that we are. And in that vulnerability to understand that wherever there has been evidence of growth, evolution, development, there has surely been a history of challenge. Neil Donald Walsh, I think, said that you cannot know here without there. You cannot know up without down. You cannot know left without right. You cannot know light without dark. And so when we speak about being uh, vulnerable and being able to, to talk and present and step in from that kind of vulnerable space, um, it will be the coming together 
of the uh, challenges that have been um, lived through and the growth uh, that has occurred as a result. Um, I know for me on a personal level, that has certainly run true in my own life um, and has been the shifting point for my whole career um, and certainly on a professional level in witnessing the vulnerability of others is when they get to step into their truth and feel safe in being invited to do that. Andy. How does that concept of vulnerability resonate with you? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it in terms of my role from advanced technology and so on. And I, I, I think it, it's relevant in every space. So from my space, thinking about applying things to mental health and personal engagement and that kind of thing, I think one of the barriers to vulnerability is what we believe we know. Many people are seeking refuge in their knowledge and knowledge about themselves or knowledge about systems and i think that hiding in the space of what we know is the barrier to understanding other cultures other spaces uh, accepting a concept like the whole dynamic range of the superhero metaphor in life right um, and when i'm talking to people the biggest barrier i have to making progress uh, that makes sense in a humanistic way, trying to apply technology that way, is that they know. And I find myself stopping people and saying, you know, maybe you should focus on what you might not know, because that's okay. I mean, you think you've got that, but how about we look at this? Because this might show you more about others and reflected back more about yourself. So I think in the best spaces, in therapeutic spaces, we tend to give what we have from our own experience. You can learn whatever you like from a manual, but when there's that chemistry there in a therapeutic environment, you're really giving what you have from your own knowledge. And when you transact in that way, um, outside a therapeutic session with people, you're actually listening to people and learning from them. You have to be aware that you don't know stuff. There's an amazing power in that. And that's about building relationship. And you have to be vulnerable because if you don't know, you're not the expert, you don't have control. And giving that up sometimes is really great. I had uh, never thought before of professional vulnerability. I had always focused on personal vulnerability. That's a that's just a, a huge area and certainly something that that all of us as professionals need to be thinking about as well. So Alex, your final thoughts on vulnerability? Yeah, um, well, I think vulnerability is one of those things that uh, you have to be able to uh, acknowledge in yourself and to be able to feel vulnerable at times otherwise it's really hard to um, connect deeply with other people um, and yet if you're always feeling vulnerable then that can sort of be a chronic stressor so you need to find other ways sometimes to manage your vulnerability and as with everything in people there's sort of like a you know a, a distribution uh, that's different for different people, and that some people are going to be feeling vulnerable almost all the time, and they'll need to practice learning ways to to manage that themselves better. And other people, they never feel vulnerable, they're never aware of the vulnerability that they're feeling, and they're going to need to practice feeling a little bit more vulnerable. Uh, and so, and also you know that's going to change for different people at different times throughout the day or throughout your life and so realizing that you know there are different tools you need to do and at this you know whatever specific challenge you're facing at this time okay do i need to is it more helpful to practice you know managing my vulnerability or like nope do i just need to sit with it and accept it or you know connect with other people about it find you know and experiment yeah. your way through it so Sharon, first of all, thank you for being vulnerable. And what are your final thoughts on that? Well, I'd say it would be at that intersection of um, authenticity, courage, and the vulnerability. I know that, again, 
being in office, I put myself out there when I was, I mean, I was assaulted the day after I was elected. I had to let my constituents know I was a victim of domestic violence. And that's why I did work in that area. Then I got diagnosed with cancer and I let people know that I was going through cancer treatment because I didn't want them to think that I had gone missing for no reason. So by the time I got to, you know, being the minister and admitting that I had cancer or had, you know, mental health issues, um, again, political staff were still flipping out because they didn't want me expressing that kind of vul vulnerability. And for me, the vulnerability was a combination of, again, courage and authenticity. I wanted not just my constituents, but I wanted every Manitoban to know that I was no different from them. I was battling things similar to what a lot of them were going through. But I also recognized that I was doing so in a position of authority. And if I could use that lived experience and that vulnerability to make life a better, you know, make make the province a better place for them, well, then by God, I was going to do it. I was going to take my lemons and make lemonade. And sometimes that's where our vulnerability comes from, is recognizing I could suck on these lemons and be bitter, or I can crack open a nice big, I'm going to make a big jug of lemonade for other folks and do that. And that's that's how I looked at, at vulnerability is sometimes it's what you're doing with your lemons. Uh, so David, wrap, give, us a, give us a bit of a wrap up on this whole topic as we near the end of this? Well, I mean, I think it, it really does come down to the fact that all of us are gonna, as individuals, set our own line. But we cannot move forward to tackle these, these problems unless we're willing to tiptoe over that comfort line um, and, and reconcile what comes with that. And that requires compassion, of course, for others, but it also requires a foundation of self-compassion and self-forgiveness. And I think that uh, all all the speakers have highlighted how important it is for us to lean into the tough conversations with one another uh, to, to move ourselves forward as a community. Oh, thank you. Uh, just a huge thank you to all of you for an incredibly enlightening session. And thank you all out there for being here with us. Uh, and again, as Renee Brown says, shame is the most powerful master emotion it's the fear that we're not good enough but we all are good enough and together I believe we can be even better <laughs>